Um, hello, uh, everybody. A good afternoon and welcome to this uh, third installment of, of the series Classics in Molecular and Materials Modeling. Uh, this is a, a joint initiative organized by CCAM and Marble. I, I'm Ignacio Pavanarraga, the CCAM director, and we have here with us uh, Nicola Mazzari, the uh, leader of Marble. And also, it's a pleasure to introduce you, David Vanderbilt from Rutgers University and Rafael Resta from Democritus, the uh, speakers that we will have today. Uh, I'd like to say that this, this is an initiative uh, a bit unusual that came out uh, in, we started to think about it in 2019 when SICAM celebrated its 50th anniversary. That was a good moment to, to look back and to reflect about what uh, SICAM has brought uh, fostering scientific cooperation in the area of, of uh, especially of computational molecular modeling, computational uh, physics and, and chemistry. And obviously the development of methods and algorithms has played a central role. And it was a good moment to try to identify how SICAM had contributed and had catalyzed or fostered the development of some of these seminal methods that have become classics and are used by, by the community. Uh, at that time then, uh, in the discussions with Nicola, we really appreciated that he very rapidly engaged in and thought that this was really an interesting initiative. So we started it together from the beginning. And in this, in this format, we ask, we, we identify seminal work on methods uh, and identify the, uh, the, the pioneers, the uh, originators of these methods and invite them to present them so that we can better appreciate what they have brought uh, and also to understand what has been the impact, how they have developed and how they have been impacting our community. We do that by having uh, two present, I mean, presentations by, by the two uh, speakers. So, if I can move on, I'm having that now here. So uh, coming to the, to the layout of the session today, as I said, there will be a first talk by David Vanderbilt on uh, conceptual aspects of the theory of electric polarization. And uh, after a short break, a second one by Rafael Resta on electronic electric polarization, orbital magnetization, and other geometrical observables. And, but we also like to, to have a second part, or if you want a third, uh, part of this, uh, this uh, session in which we want to create a more uh, convivial or in, in informal uh, interviews where we can appreciate not only formally the concepts and the science behind the methods, but also try to approach the uh, or grasp what was the, the creative process, how this, uh, the, the two people engaged and, and really got into these, these methods and ideas. And, and we think that also provides a complementary approach to, to understand how science uh, uh, evolved, how this is produced. And I think that's also very useful to, to the community. And I, I think especially for, for younger generations who normally don't have the chance to, to understand how this is started. Uh, this, this is, I should also say, this is the first uh, event that we hold online. I hope this will help to, to bring a large, I mean, the previous ones have happened in, in the EPFL. Um, and I, I hope that being online will, will contribute to, to bring more people to, to this uh, special session. It's also a challenge for us, especially for this third part that is more informal, having to, to hold it remotely. Let's, let's hope how, let's see how, how it works. So. I hope all of you will, will enjoy this, this session. Uh, before uh, finishing, I also wanted to take uh, advantage to indicate that there will be another uh, classics uh, installment uh, before the summer, actually the 20th of May. And this will be about uh, the methods that to compute free energies uh, of solids. And this was uh, uh, developed initially by Dan Frankel from Cambridge and Tony Ladd from now in Florida. And they will be our speakers. So if you like this format, uh, I invite you also to note in your agendas this second, uh, the next installment in, in the month of May. 
Um, the, the, all these sessions, I mean, the previous two, and this one and, and the forthcoming ones, uh, are stored in uh, both in the CCAM webpage and in the uh, Materials Club webpage, where you can go and revisit them, or if you missed the previous two, uh, you can also watch them. And also, I wanted to take advantage to mention that Marvel, before summer, I mean, they also organize periodically distinguished lectures. And the next uh, two ones in April and May will be uh, delivered by Christine Person from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. She will be talking about data driven materials, innovation, and design. And in May, George Cresce from Vienna University will talk about ab initio accuracy for phase diagrams and the use of machine learning for fields. I think, I hope you find this also interesting and want to join. And I will finish also by mentioning another uh, online activity that we started uh, this year in CICAM. We call the CICAM Mixed Gen Series. This is a monthly event that is addressed to a younger, I mean, researchers in their earlier stages. So we are thinking in, in PhDs and postdoctoral researchers who are suffering also from uh, the pandemics. And, and the idea here is to have a more interactive event where we invite a, we identify a topic, an area, we invite an outstanding lecturer. Uh, and then there are also, there is an interactive poster session that, that is organized where and then we select out of the posters two of them to be delivered also as lectures and we invite uh, more experienced researchers to be around so that they can interact with posters presenters. The next one will be this week on Thursday, and this will be a session on Quantum Monte Carlo with uh, the main uh, lecture delivered by David Stepherly from the uh, University of Illinois on simulating quantum systems. And in April, 8th of April, there will be the fourth on data-driven science where the lecturer will be Claudia Draxel from Humboldt University, and she will be talking about from data to knowledge. So again, if you're interested, you can find the information uh, in this case in the CICAM webpage for the distinguished like lectures in the Marvel webpage. And I hope you can follow up uh, our uh, coming online activities. And without any further delay, now I give the word to the chairman of today's uh, uh, event, which is uh, Nicola. So please, Nicola, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ignacio, and uh, a very warm uh, welcome uh, to all of you. I'm counting uh, 446 uh, participants, uh, so that's uh, wonderful. And uh, indeed, uh, uh, you know, it's a crisis, but it's also an opportunity to, you know, be able to do these uh, activities uh, online. So my name is Nicola Marzari. I'm here as the director of uh, um, um, Marvel at EPFL. And uh, I think it's really a great uh, personal and professional uh, pleasure to welcome uh, Professor David Vanderbilt and Professor Raffaele Resta today. Actually, both of them uh, have uh, had uh, very close uh, connections uh, with EPFL. Uh, Raffaele has been a frequent visitor, maybe we'll reminisce on some of this uh, later on in the interview. And actually, I remember very well uh, hearing uh, uh, David uh, gave a seminar in the Institute of Physics uh, in 1992 on this, uh, you know, novel theories uh, of uh, polarization while he was visiting here, uh, Irma and uh, Roberto Carr. So with this, uh, let me introduce uh, the first speaker, uh, David Vanderbilt. Uh, David holds a PhD in physics uh, from uh, MIT. He was a student of uh, John Dronopoulos. Uh, and after that, he moved uh, to UC Berkeley as a Miller Fellow and started in 1984 in Harvard as an assistant and then an associate professor. Uh, he moved uh, to Rutgers University in 1991 as professor, full professor, uh, and is there uh, now the Board of Governors uh, professor. Um, he has been inducted in the National Academy of Sciences, uh, in the National Academy of Arts and Sciences, is a fellow of the APS, uh, a Simons fellow, and also in 2006, a recipient of the Anis Raman Prize from the American Physical Society for Computational Physics. So with this, uh, David, um, I welcome you very much. Uh, we'll have 40 minutes for your talk, 10 minutes of questions, and everyone is welcome to write their questions in the question and answer session or to raise their hand and then I'll unmute them and so they can ask the question live. 
David, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, so let me um, let me put my put my slides up. I hope you see that. All great. Uh, it's a wonderful um, uh, opportunity. I really appreciate. Uh, uh, oh, now I've got this. Hold on a second. Oh well, let's just. Uh, I've got my. Um, uh, oh shucks, sorry. I've got uh, I've got my screen. Let me stop my share for a second and restart. Okay, I'll live with this. Um, okay, um, the uh, the talk I plan to give today is on the theory of uh, electrical polarization and then also touching on orbital magnetization and anomalous hole conductivity. Um, this talk is different from almost every other talk I've, I've given. I decided to focus on conceptual aspects and you're going to hear almost nothing about actual uh, the Berry phase theory and the formal development of it. I'm doing that in part because uh, I'm, I'm putting some of that on uh, Rafaela, I guess, uh, to manage some of that uh, in his talk. Um, but also, I think it's kind of an underappreciated aspect of the theory. Um, and um, I, um, uh, uh, this part of the um, uh, this talk, in some ways, re resembles the first chapter of my. Uh, book uh, which came out recently on uh, the theory of Berry phases and so on. And um, uh, in that first chapter of the book, I do something similar. I really focus on conceptual aspects without introducing uh, mathematical descriptions yet, um, because the conceptual aspects do give us a huge number of hints about what the mathematical framework is going to have to look like. Uh, what I'm also uh, not doing is giving a historical introduction. I'll do a little bit more of that during the discussion section that comes after Raffaella's talk. Um, uh, and so it's it's neither uh, a straightforward uh, uh, introduction uh, to the form of the theory nor a historical discussion of how it came about, but perhaps uh, a discussion of how it it should have come and should have come about, how we should have understood from more elementary and, um, uh, aspects of understanding the physics of uh, classical and then quantum mechanical uh, insulators, how a framework of this kind had to be uh, developed. For example, the fact that um, uh, polarization uh, can't be a single number, it has to be a multi-valued uh, or um, um, uh, 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 only well-defined modulo a quantum. Um, and so to do that, uh, I'm going to begin by introducing uh, a kind of a classical theory of point charge systems uh, first and uh, explain how uh, these aspects have to appear there and then basically say, well, why should we be able to do better when we do a quantum mechanical framework? The quantum mechanical framework has to have the same kind of behaviors. Um, so most of the talk will be in the context of the theory of polarization, but then at the end I'll talk uh, some about orbital magnetization and anomalous hole uh, conductivity. Okay, so um, <clears throat> what's the problem with the theory of polarization? I think most of you are probably familiar with this. In the simple textbooks, you have this sort of clausius masati picture in which solids are composed of little polarized entities that are well separated from one another and you calculate the dipole moment um, and divide by unit cell volume, and that's the polarization. So there's no issue. Uh, <clears throat> but once you go to a quantum mechanical uh, uh, view of a crystalline solid, you have uh, integer point uh, nuclear charges, and then you have distributed electron clouds due to quantum mechanics. And uh, this is a sketch of uh, sort of what the electron clouds might look like in a toy model. Uh, and there's no way to divide this into um, unit cells in a natural way. Um, this is a picture that I love and was generated by our chairman, uh, I don't know, more than 20 years ago, I hate to think how long ago, uh, but it's a beautiful picture of charge density contours in uh, lead titanate, uh, illustrating that there are no well separated charge entities, that the charge density fills the entire unit cell, and so there's no way, there's no obvious way to divide it into uh, simple uh, dipole uh, uh, entities. 
Um, so again, just to belabor the point a little bit more, I have this kind of uh, crystalline solid. It has uh, broken inversion symmetry, so it should have a polarization in the vertical direction. Um, but depending upon where I put the unit cell and then I compute the dipole moment per unit cell, and I, you know, I'm going to try to attribute that to a polarization, Depending upon where I put the boundaries of the unit cell here, I've got a lot of negative charge at the bottom, so the polarization is up, and here the polarization is in the other direction. So the polarization depends upon where I choose my unit cell boundaries, which is clearly um, not uh, acceptable. And the conclusion from thinking through uh, you know, this problem uh, and a, a number of related problems is that even if you have an exact and precise knowledge of the bulk charge density everywhere in the unit cell in the bulk of, a, a, of an insulator, uh, that's not enough even in principle to determine the polarization. The polarization uh, uh, has to come from some further information that's not simply the, available in the charge density. And the heart of the problem is that a dipole is basically a coordinate times a charge density, and this kind of operator is not uh, uh, expectation of this is not periodic um, in the unit cell. It grows without bound as R becomes large, uh, or uh, uh, another way of saying it is that matrix elements of the position oper operator are not well defined in the block uh, representation. Okay, so um, <clears throat> uh, what to do about this? Well, what I'd like to do is is to imagine for a moment that the universe is built on a different physics. There is no quantum mechanics. It's purely classical. And all the charges are integer point charges, which are red here. Those are like nuclei. But also, instead of electrons, we have integer negative point charges. If you like, you can think of this as an extreme ionic uh, picture, where these are sodium and, and chlorine, uh, uh, chlorine uh, ions or something like that. But for the moment, let's just say that they're uh, a fictitious ph physics of positive and negative point charges. And so we have crystals, and we want to be able to describe what is the polarization of this of this crystal. So uh, you know we introduce a unit cell and we calculate the dipole moment in the unit cell. Uh, in this uh, these slides, I'm using lowercase p as a um, uh, as a, a displaced a polarization displacement vector, which just points from the negative charge to the positive charge. And then uh, the conventional polarization is this um, uh, displacement vector times the quantum of charge divided by cell volume, right? So, so that would define uh, the polarization. But uh, you know, how did I get to choose that unit cell? I could have just as easily chosen uh, some other unit cell. And uh, in this case, the uh, charge displacement vector is in the opposite direction. And so I have two different values of polarization that seem equally, uh, equally, uh, equally good. And they differ, of course, by the vector that points from one positive charge to another positive charge, which is uh, nothing other than the, the lattice vector. So, so this says that the, the polarization is only well-defined modulo a quantum, and that quantum is the quantum of charge times the lattice vector divided by cell volume. Um, and um, of course, there aren't only uh, two possible values of um, uh, polarization. I could choose a unit cell perversely to include, you know, that negative charge and that positive charge, or that negative charge and that positive charge. So, in fact, um, there's an entire lattice of polarization values, uh, all of which are equally uh, equally valid uh, descriptions of the electric polarization in this in this uh, in this uh, solid. So that sounds very unsatisfactory. If you have many, many different values of polarization, you know, uh, which one is the right one? That, you know, how are you going to ever calculate anything? Well, um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, three, okay. So, uh, <clears throat> so what you can calculate, of course, is the change in polarization. And uh, Raffaella is uh, responsible, I think, in the early 90s for um, pushing uh, the community in the direction of looking at changes in polarization. So here, I'm going to look at changes of polarization as I move the negative uh, point charges from some initial position uh, to some final position. And of course, in that case, um, the change in polarization, well, since it's a negative charge, I drew the arrow backwards, but the change in polarization is just related to the, to the shift of those, of those negative ions. Um, and Knowing the path along which this ion um, traversed, uh, we have a unique uh, value for the change in polarization. 
And that would, for example, describe how much charge is pumped from the left surface to the right surface of the sample. That could be something that's experimentally measurable. Um, of course, uh, there are other ways for the charge to go from the initial position to the final position. And uh, here's one of them. And uh, of course, this reflects the fact that the polarization is multivalued. And so in this case, the change of polarization was in the other direction. And the difference between the first change in polarization and the second change in polarization is, again, uh, the polarization quantum. So the story here is that if you follow some uh, uh, you know, continuous, uh, I'll use the word adiabatic when I get to quantum mechanics, uh, like adiabatic path of the uh, system as it evolves from one state to another state, the change in polarization is well defined uh, even uh, up to everything if you know the path. If you don't know the path, it's only well defined up to, up to a quantum. Uh, another uh, aspect of this or another way to look at it is to think in terms of closed paths. So if I look at all possible closed paths in which the ions uh, undergo some deformation and then come back to their initial uh, positions, then either the polarization change is zero, which is what I just showed, uh, or it's also possible that I can find paths uh, like this one, where it comes back to its initial configuration. In the bulk, uh, there's no distinction between the initial configuration and the final one, so it really is a closed path. Um, but of course, um, the result of that is that we pumped a charge by a lattice vector, and so the uh, change in um, polarization on that path was just uh, uh, the quantum polarization. It's electron charge times the lattice vector by which the charges were, were displaced. So this is what the theory of electric polarization uh, has to look like for systems of uh, you know, point quantized uh, point charges uh, in some uh, fictitious physics. And uh, here's a summary. Polarization is only uh, defined up to a quantum. Uh, changes in polarization are well defined if we know the path. Um, uh, the change in polarization is independent of the rate of traversal. Um, for closed paths, uh, the change in polarization is an integer times the quantum of polarization. This is called uh, quantization of adiabatic charge transport. Um, uh, the polarization, uh, I haven't really gone into this, but um, uh, the polarization uh, obeys desired relations. Uh, here, uh, I have two derivatives of the polarization. And as long as you're taking derivatives, you don't have to worry about this uh, ill-determined uh, quantum because you're only making small uh, changes and you can follow the polarization um, that you're um, uh, interested in. So one is the change of polarization with respect to time is a macroscopic current flow. And the um, uh, gradient of polarization with respect to space is some excess bound charge. Uh, and related to that is that the surface polarization is given by the bulk polarization uh, dotted into the, into the surface normal. Um, so uh, this is what um, a theory of polarization looks like for a system of point charges. Uh, what about for a truly quantum mechanical system? Well, why should we be expect to be able to do any better? I mean, you know, the whole community before 1992, 93, when this uh, formal um, the modern theory of polarization, so to speak, emerged, we were very used to calculating things uh, as expectation values of, of some operators. Charge densities, total energies, forces were all expectation values of, uh, charge, uh, of operators, and, and that always gives you a single absolute answer. But any theory uh, for electric polarization that gives you a single absolute answer uh, must, that's supposed to say must, uh, must be wrong. Must be wrong because why should we expect our theory to do any better for a quantum mechanical system than it did for this even simpler system of elementary um, point charges? So we cannot expect the polarization to be described by any formula that writes it as an expectation value of an operator in the same way that we would for a charge density or a force or a total energy. Um, so I don't think we appreciated this enough at the time. Uh, we were sort of uh, forced into developing this theory um, because we were trying to calculate things in barium titanate and, uh, and uh, we weren't really thinking deeply enough. Um, but uh, this in retrospect is I think how we should have uh, approached the theory. And so 
a theory of a quantum theory of polarization has to have these same features. It should have all of the same features um, uh, that um, that the previous theory had. And in particular, it should obey the quantization of adiabatic charge transport. And uh, I re regard this as sort of the, the most crucial feature, because once you have this feature, then the other features uh, more or less uh, follow. And so let me try to explain that a little bit. So what do I have here? Um, what I have here is a, a simple uh, tight binding model with uh, three sites per unit cell in one dimension. This is the X dimension. This is the site energy. And uh, there are hoppings that I haven't drawn between neighboring sites. And uh, the site energies um, uh, alternate uh, in some way on every third site. And here I've put two of the site energies lower in energy. So if there's an electron in the system, it'll tend to sit in this lower energy site. Of course, the electron charge density is really distributed. If you want to, you can think of this black dot as the center of a Wannier function, which is somehow distributed but exponentially loca localized in the vicinity of this, um, <clears throat> of this particular center. So that's what I wrote down here, Wannier charge center. Uh, and here's the lattice constant. And uh, now suppose I make a slow adiabatic change of the Hamiltonian by uh, changing some of these site energies. So for example, I lower one of the site energies and then raise one of the site energies. And now the uh, system is just shifted by a third of a lattice constant. And then I do it again and it's shifted by two thirds of a lattice constant. And I do it again and now it's shifted by a full lattice constant. And, um, uh, and so now the Hamiltonian is exactly back in its uh, initial Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian has gone in a closed loop and come back to itself. Uh, but in the process, it looks like we've moved one uh, electron of charge minus E by one lattice vector. And so the polarization is changed by that divided by one unit cell. Now, uh, clearly, if this um, uh, site energy difference were you know, very large, like 100 electron volts, then this electron would be very, very tightly localized to this site. And it would be true that when we move it by a lattice vector, we would have exactly this uh, change in, in polarization. In the theory of um, uh, quantized point uh, uh, positive and negative charges, we would also have exactly this value. But in the real quantum mechanics in which the charge distribution is really distributed, it's described by block electrons and so on, uh, we would be forgiven for doubting that the um, uh, exact change in polarization could possibly be the same exact value. We would expect that we would have some corrections from the fact that we have quantum mechanical charge clouds. Um, well, uh, the fact is that uh, if, uh, uh, you know, if it's if it's true that there are corrections, then we have serious problems for making a theory of electric polarization. So conversely, if it's the case that those cyclic uh, 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 changes in polarization around a closed cycle are always um, giving you zero or the quantum of polarization, then we can develop a theory of polarization. Okay, so let me just explain that in the next uh, two slides. So again, um, if I go around a, a closed loop, uh, this is some parameter space that I'm drawing here, some curve C in parameter space, and the polarization change over that loop is given by, so I'm saying, suppose I have a, a proper theory of polarization, the polarization is a function of the instantaneous um, uh, condition of the system uh, described by parameter lambda, but lambda in turn uh, varies slowly with t. And um, in quantum mechanics, um, we have to assume that the change of the rate of change of lambda and therefore of the Hamiltonian is slow enough that we're in the adiabatic limit. That is to say that the basically um, the inverse of the time scale on which uh, the Hamiltonian is changing uh, times h bar is small compared to typical energy spacings between um, bands or levels. Okay, so uh, the change in polarization is given by integrating up the time rate of change with time. But if I use the chain rule, this is the change of polarization with respect to parameter and then parameter uh, with respect to time, you cancel the times and it's really just a change of the polarization with respect to parameter times the parameter, right? So this is essentially Resta's famous uh, formula from 1992. 
And so uh, if this thing is always equal to an integer times the electron charge, that is to say, if it's always uh, following the quantum, then we can develop a proper theory of polarization. The polarization is well-defined modulo an electron charge, even in quantum mechanics. And uh, you know, the reason for that um, uh, is illustrated in this, uh, in this figure here. Um, here, the um, polarization change in going from uh, lambda one to lambda two between two different uh, uh, um, configurations of a system, for example, some ferroelectric where the uh, titanium atom is moving off center or something, um, is given by integrating up the uh, change in polarization along path A. And if I do it along path B, I get this other value. And I ask whether those two values are the same or different. And uh, they'd better be the same if we have a proper theory of polarization, or at least they'd better be the same up to a quantum. And um, they are the same up to a quantum if what I said on the previous slide is true, uh, namely if the closed loop is a quantum. And the reason is, is very simple. The path that goes from uh, lambda one to A is the same as the path that goes all the way around from lambda one and follows the closed path and then follows B back to lambda two, right? So those, uh, So that's what's written in this equation. And therefore, if this thing is quantized, it means that any two uh, measurements of the any two calculations of the change in polarization will agree up to up to a charge uh, quantum. And of course, this um, uh, is just like uh, the physics that I described for uh, fictitious uh, physics of integer point charges. And also this integer n, I can say is quote unquote normally zero, uh, which is a good thing. Most of the time we don't have to worry about it. Um, and uh, when we do have to worry about it is basically when there's some um, obstruction to uh, shrinking this path to zero. So if I make a slight change of this path C, um, the um, uh, integer value of this uh, loop integral uh, can't change smoothly. An integer value can only uh, become ill-defined or jump. And so if there's a region here in which the system is no longer an insulator, but there's some gap closure, uh, then it's possible for the uh, loop integral uh, to be uh, a non-zero integer times the charge quantum. And so we do have the situation like this, where in principle, you could have two configurations and the change in polarization would depend upon path A or path B, uh, but that only happens if, uh, you know, if there's a, an obstruction to collapsing the loop uh, to a point, at which point, obviously, the loop integral has to be zero. Um, okay, so I said, um, uh, you know, uh, if uh, uh, if this uh, quantization of the uh, uh, closed loop um, uh, is correct, then we have a theory of polarization. Can I argue on physical grounds uh, that this uh, 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 hypothesis is correct. That is to say that closed loop changes of polarization are always zero. And uh, let me give two kind of heuristic um, uh, <clears throat> um, uh, justifications of uh, physical arguments as to as to why that's the case. So the first of them has to do with this um, equation I wrote down on one previous slide, which is that the surface charge density is equal to the polarization times the surface normal. So, you know, in the ordinary clausius Masati picture, that basically says that there's an electric polarization and then I have some positive bound charge on one surface and positive a negative bound charge on the other surface. And um, so if we have a proper theory of polarization, we expect uh, the same thing to be true, at least uh, under some conditions. And um, uh, the, the proper conditions to consider in this case are, uh, first of all, the bulk has to be a periodic insulator uh, with a gap. The surface also has to be insulating uh, with a gap which is uh, common to the gap of the surface with a Fermi level in both gaps. And the surface has to be a perfect uh, defect-free periodic uh, surface. So with those caveats, um, then um, it should be the case that the surface charge density is given by the bulk polarization. And so um, we tend to think of surface charge density as a surface property. But under these conditions, it's not really a surface property. It's um, a symptom of the bulk polarization, except that the bulk polarization has this uh, uncertainty modulo a quantum. So that means that the surface charge density would also have to be uncertain modulo a quantum. 
And actually that's consistent with these conditions. I can satisfy these conditions in multiple ways. So for example, suppose I have some uh, crystal and here I'm sketching the density of states or local density of states versus energy. And uh, here's the bulk valence band and here's the bulk conduction band. And in this particular crystal, it's, it's something like a silicon surface with a dangling bond surface band that's uh, in the middle of the gap. And um, on Monday, I can prepare this surface so that this uh, surface band is fully occupied. And on Tuesday, I can prepare it so that it's completely empty. And the difference in the surface charge density between those two configurations, of course, is just uh, one electron charge or two with spin uh, per surface unit cell area. And if I attribute that to a bulk polarization, that means that the bulk polarization has to change by uh, um, an electron charge times a lattice vector over the cell volume, which is essentially the, the polarization. And so um, any, uh, uh, any uh, theory of polarization uh, um, is, is required to have the property that uh, surface charges you know, if we uh, if we take this as a requirement that the surface charge uh, has to be related to the polarization in this way, then the polarization has to have the property that it's um, a modulus, uh, a quantum is an exact thing, not just an approximate thing. Here's another um, uh, second um, uh, physics argument um, about why the polarization um, along two different paths should be quantized, or another way of saying it is uh, going around a closed loop should be quantized. And here what I'm doing is making the variation of the Hamiltonian with the parameter occur not in time, but in space. So I imagine that I have a, a crystal, uh, maybe this is a one dimensional crystal, or maybe it's periodic in the other two dimensions. But the main thing is that I make a long supercell of uh, N unit cells of length A, and the Hamiltonian at the left end and the Hamiltonian at the right end are exactly the same Hamiltonian. Uh, lambda equals zero and lambda equals one are, you know, in my notation, the same uh, point on the loop. And then it varies slowly uh, in between here uh, as I go. Uh, and then I have uh, the whole system is in a big supercell of length uh, L. And so if I calculate the uh, change in polarization uh, uh, with respect to X uh, over the length of the cell, I can again do the chain rule and, and multiply out the delta, divide out the delta DXs, and I get that this is the, the loop polarization. So now is this quantized exactly uh, to be zero, oops, zero or an electron charge times an integer? Well, I argue yes. Why? Because uh, I can also interpret this integral of DP DX as the integral, so, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the derivative of the polarization is nothing other than minus the bound charge. I should have written row bound here, I guess. So I integrate up the bound charge and I get a total Q bound charge. Um, this is the extra charge that comes from the polarization variation relative to what it would have been in the supercell if the Hamiltonian were uniform uh, throughout the entire length of the sample. And I argue that that has to be an integer uh, times an electron charge. Why? because if I calculate the total number of electrons in this supercell, it has to be an integer. That's a general principle of uh, quantum mechanics of periodic solids, that if you calculate the total number of electrons in a set of filled bands, it's equal to the number of filled bands, and that is always an integer in uh, an insulator. And therefore, the total bound charge has to be an integer, and therefore, the integral of the loop polarization has to be exactly zero or quantized in integer multiples of the of the charge quantum. Okay, so uh, uh, the form of the theory that uh, comes out of this, um, one way of thinking about uh, uh, about it is that uh, uh, we have a problem taking expectation values of the coordinate operator, <clears throat> but instead, if we take expectation values of uh, it's not exactly an expectation value. If we take gradients with respect to wave vector. Um, if you uh, think in terms of the quantum mechanical um, uh, association of uh, momentum with the gradient with respect to position, then uh, it's plausible that a coordinate is associated with a gradient with respect to a wave vector. And so um, uh, this is sort of the direction that the theory eventually went. 
but it, it took us a long time to get there because we were so used to thinking of systems in which the properties of interest, charge densities, forces, energies, were always expectation values of operators. Um, but this gradient with respect to wave vector, you know, that's not a single particle operator. That's something else. That's something that involves a derivative with respect to wave vector k, which is sort of a parameter on the Hamiltonian uh, of uh, the state vectors. So the modern view of this um, is that we have uh, some manifold, uh, which is our um, Gruen zone, uh, k-space, and we have a mapping from this ma ma manifold. Each point on the manifold I have associated with that a block function, and for technical reasons we prefer to use the cell periodic block function. And then from derivatives on this manifold, we construct Berry connections and Berry curvatures. And by uh, looking at paths along this manifold, uh, we describe Berry phases. And by looking at um, integrals over these things, we define churn numbers and, and so on. And so this is the framework um, in which uh, the theory of polarization really has to be uh, formulated and uh, orbital magnetization and other things. Okay. Uh, and uh, furthermore, um, you know, a, a manifold um, uh, lends itself to topological properties if it's a closed manifold. And the Brewan zone is always a closed manifold. And so uh, in one dimension, uh, this is not the conventional way of doing it, but I've drawn the Brewan zone as a unit circle because it really is a closed manifold. And I've drawn two energy bands plotted vertically on this cylinder. And for each one of them, I can calculate this thing, which of course, I haven't talked about Berry phases, uh, but there it is. In the two-dimensional Brewan zone, I can calculate Berry phases across the zone or in three because they're really closed manifold, the two torus and a three torus. Um, okay, so in the uh, uh, last part of the talk, I wanted to say a few things about, um, uh, about um, uh, orbital magnetization, and really this is going to lead rather quickly to anomalous Hall conductivity. What do I have? I've got a, about 10 minutes left. All right. Um, so um, again, what's the problem? In a toy picture in which uh, uh, you have uh, magnetism, of course, most of the magnetism is normally spin magnetism, but you also have some orbital moments on atoms. And if you think of those as all localized with uh, nothing in the interstitial region, then you can compute an orbital moment for each one and compute a magnetization. And then there's a surface current that flows along the surface, which is um, a manifestation of this orbital magnetization. And in insulators, this uh, current flowing along the edge is a dissipationless uh, current, obviously. Um, it's not a it's not a free current. Um, so um, the you know, the the current that flows on the edge is a dissipationless current. The mag magnetization is a bulk property. The surface current is given by this formula, which is the analog of the charge density being the polarization times the unit normal. And um, and the surface current is only apparently a surface property. It's really a manifestation of the bulk mag magnetization. Um, in the case of the orbital magnetization, uh, this is really a, a stronger property. In the case of the electric polarization, I had to put various conditions. Uh, oh, here I just changed uh, changed uh, from three dimensions to two dimensions. So um, in the case of electric polarization, I had to put various conditions that the surface had to be insulating and perfect and so on. That's really not the case with orbital magnetization. So suppose I have a, a, a two-dimensional system here this gray area is the bulk of the crystal. It has some orbital magnetization, and so there are edge currents flowing along the edge. If the edge current in region A is different from the region B because I somehow terminated this uh, edge A differently um, uh, or added some add atoms to edge A or whatever, then I would have a charge accumulation at this, at, at this point, and that's not, that's not possible. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about a system in its ground state, and a ground state is a stationary state, and the divergence of the current has to be zero everywhere in a stationary state. So both of these currents, IA and IB, are nothing other than MZ. They're really slaved directly to the bulk magnetization. So we have this dissipationless edge current that flows even if the bulk and surface are both insulating. And in this case, it's, it's completely slaved to the, um, to the bulk. And uh, I'll, I'll discuss all of this in the context of insulating um, 
uh, systems, but much of what I say is true of metallic systems as well, but not everything. Here's a question. Uh, is it possible to have a, an insulator? Let's imagine this is a two-dimensional insulator in which you have a, a, a macroscopic current flowing through the um, insulator. And of course, you'd say, well, of course not if it's an insulator. Um, but, uh, but from quantum Hall effect type of physics, uh, we suspect that the answer may not be so simple as that. So uh, here's a simple argument why you can't have a current flowing. Um, we have to have conservation of charge. So if there's a current flowing upwards, um, then we have to have some kind of circulation of current around the boundary that has the property that the current becomes stronger and stronger as I go to the left here, because it's collect, if you think of this as rainwater coming off of a roof, then you have to have more and more flow as you come here. And so uh, it has to be the case that the um, current um, uh, along the surface uh, varies as I go along the surface. But the physics of the edge here and the physics of the edge here are identical. So how can the current possibly be different? So the answer is, at some level, uh, no, you can't have a, a, a current flowing like that. Does it help if the edges are conducting? Uh, no, not really. I mean, suppose that I, I put some, um, uh, this is a, a little picture of the valence band and the conduction band projected in the one dimensional wave vector space. And I've got a surface band that comes and cuts the Fermi energy. And you can ask, does that affect the argument that I gave on the previous slide? Does it affect the, the edge current that's flowing on the edge now that I have these free currents as well as the bound currents? And um, there's a simple argument that I won't go through in detail. If I uh, look at one of the crossings of the Fermi energy, and I imagine uh, changing the Fermi energy from E1 to E2, and calculating how much extra current is flowing by integrating up the extra uh, electron states that are occupied as I change the uh, Fermi energy that's given here. Uh, I've got the group velocity times the number of states. I get a cancellation, and I get that the uh, total uh, number of <clears throat> the total current that flows, uh, if I uh, write it as a derivative with respect to the uh, electrostatic uh, potential, is just exactly e squared over h times the um, uh, times the shift in the in the energy. So I have this sort of a quantized behavior of the conductance in the sense of extra current that flows as I change the um, Fermi level. And so uh, so that would allow me to change the uh, current flowing at an edge. But of course, uh, what happens is that this band crosses again in the opposite direction and I get a cancellation. And so it, it doesn't affect any of the argument that I gave on the previous slide. However, there is something that changes the whole argument. Suppose that I have some external electric field. This curly, curly E in my notation is, is an electric field, a small uh, but uniform electric field applied in the x direction. And now what happens is that the uh, conditions along the edge are actually not really identical. The electrostatic potential is higher here and lower here, and then it's all the same here, and then the electrostatic potential changes along the top edge. So if you can argue that the current that's flowing on the boundary varies with the electrostatic potential, then this becomes possible. Uh, and, uh, and that's the case if you have a band, a surface band that crosses in only one direction. This is only possible if you have broken time reversal symmetry. Uh, you also have broken inversion at the edge always. And so this looks like a very bizarre band structure, but it's a possibility at an edge band structure of a, a ferromagnetic two-dimensional uh, system. And in this case, what happens is you only have an up crossing and not a down crossing. And it turns out that if you uh, calculate uh, how much uh, current, um, if you assume that there's a current that is flowing in the vertical direction in response to the electric field in the horizontal direction, and the ratio of those is uh, an anomalous hole conductivity, then the um, uh, variation in current on the edge is precisely what is needed to soak up the uh, sheet current flowing in the bulk if and only if the anomalous Hall conductivity is equal to e squared over h uh, for the case of a single uh, up crossing band like this. So what this says is that in, in an insulator, uh, uh, any given insulator has a topological invariant, which is the number of upcrossing bands 
on the top surface, but then it also has to be the same on all other surfaces. This side surface has two up crossing and one down crossing band, uh, and that's consistent. And the reason is that I could turn the electric field in the vertical direction, and I also have to have the same ability to soak up the current. And so basically, each two dimensional insulator is characterized by what we call a churn number, it's an in integer. Uh, for almost all systems, it's zero. Certainly for all time reversal invariant systems, it's zero. For all ferromagnetic systems, um, almost all it's zero. But for some, like the famous Haldane model, it's, it's non-zero. So uh, <clears throat> I'm almost done. An insulator can have a non-zero anomalous Hall conductivity. Um, but if it does, it has to be uh, this integer times e squared over h. And that's a characteristic of each possible two-dimensional uh, insulator. Um, what's nice about this kind of argument, uh, that's what we call the quantum anomalous Hall state. What's nice about this kind of argument is it also survives uh, things like um, turning on interactions. So uh, I've been mainly thinking in terms of a single particle physics up until now, but suppose I have some sample, I apply uh, electric field to the right, I have this sheet current flowing in the vertical direction, and now I turn on electron electron interactions in this blue region. Well, I'm not allowed to have any excess charge accumulating at the boundaries of the blue region. And therefore, the anomalous Hall conductivity also has to be exactly this, even with interactions and even with disorder and even with interactions and with disorder, right? Because I can't have any accumulation of charge. This is really just a description of the ground state of some system in a weak electric field etc. Okay, so um, this is my uh, essentially um, summary slide. The modern theories of polarization and uh, magnetization involve this uh, paradigm shift away from expectation values and towards things that are based on adiabatic loops, quantities that are only well-defined modulo quantum. These formal formalisms uh, hint strongly at, um, but in this talk I haven't described uh, in detail, uh, what are Berry phases, Berry curvatures, churn numbers, and so on. Um, in this talk, I've left out uh, innumerable uh, other hints at the correct physics. I think I mentioned quantum Hall physics at one point, the carpless Luttinger theory of the anomalous Hall effect, uh, the Zach phase, and so on, all things that predated uh, our, so, so to speak, modern theory of polarization. And, um, and of course, uh, I think most of you are also aware that um, this whole um, uh, uh, theory um, uh, is in some ways a precursor to the modern rage uh, of the last 15 years, uh, which is the theory of topological insulators and semimetals, which also depend a lot on uh, similar uh, concepts of berry phases and curvatures. So uh, with that, I think I'm out of time and uh, I'll thank you for your um, uh, uh, let me stop the share. I'll restart the share if people have questions about the about the uh, about the slides. So uh, thanks for your attention. Thank you, thank you, David. Um, a real a real classic. Uh, we enjoy this uh, very much. Um, we can take live questions, and people are uh, welcome to raise their hands, uh, and uh, I'll uh, unmute them. Or uh, people are also uh, welcome to uh, write uh, questions in the. Q&A panel uh, of Zoom, and I'll read them. So let me actually start uh, with uh, one from uh, the question and answer panel. Um, could you comment on the possible extension of the idea that you have shown to non-ordered systems, uh, such as uh, molecular liquids? Oh. Um, well, I really should invite Stefano Baroni and his collaborators to <laughs> uh, uh, to answer this question because um, uh, in, in a in a series of, of recent papers they they have addressed this this problem. So suppose you have, uh, I mean, you need to have an insulating fluid, uh, and 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 there are many. There are you know molten salts and so on. Um, and uh, and the temperature has to be high enough that it's a fluid, but low enough that we have a well-defined electronic insulator. And then you can ask questions about what happens if you have some charged um, species, and um, you know, and it moves through the fluid, and, and does it carry with it an exactly integer quantized uh, excess charge? And um, the answer is yes, <laughs> at least under appropriate conditions. And um, and these uh, the 
Uh, so I would refer you to the papers of uh, Stefano Baroni um, uh, that, uh, that discuss this. Essentially, one way of looking at this is to make a big supercell and, uh, and take this charged species uh, from, uh, from, from its position in one supercell to the position in the next supercell. And um, there's some previous work of uh, Andrew Rapp's group uh, that also discussed uh, this kind of thing, but more in the context of um, uh, taking a, an impurity through interstitial positions in an ionic, in, in, a, in a crystalline system. And then the, uh, the Baroni papers are more about, the, um, uh, about liquid and, and uh, liquid systems. So that's a wonderful question. Thank you, David. Um, I'll, uh, I'll keep reading. Um, another question says, uh, uh, with the recent experimental realization of uh, quantized uh, adiabatic charge transport uh, in a tauless pump uh, using uh, ultra cold atoms in optical lattices, uh, can you now imagine uh, research opportunities uh, offered uh, by these cold atom lattice systems uh, compared uh, to, say, ferroelectric materials? Uh, yeah, so the, the cold atom systems are, are fascinating. Um, you know, I think um, it, uh, it, it all depends upon uh, <laughs> where you want to go with your research career. So in terms of um, fundamental physics, the cold atom systems are fascinating. Um, they're very engineerable. Uh, that is to say, you can um, construct uh, uh, many systems that you couldn't possibly have uh, the same freedom to construct uh, out of real uh, material systems. Um, and uh, and you can explore um, you know uh, flow K systems and all kinds of things that would be difficult to do in the same way in a material system. Um, uh, on the other hand, you know uh, many of us are uh, really materials physicists at heart, and we really want to understand uh, systems of real electrons going around around real atoms in in real materials. And um, so I think both things are 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 fascinating. Um, and uh, I, I expect that the, um, uh, you know, what can be done with cold atoms will continue to inform what, 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 what our understanding is of, of materials. Um, yeah, I don't know what more to say about that. Thanks. Uh, thanks, David. I'll keep reading. Maybe I'll summarize the next question. It says, uh, you know, when we calculate the polarization at, say, complex interfaces, uh, this is often done uh, using uh, atomic displacement. Uh, and the Born effective uh, charges. And so the first part of the question is uh, uh, how accurate uh, is uh, this approach? And then uh, uh, the second part of the question asks, uh, is it this also possible to be used to estimate uh, flexoelectric uh, polarization and uh, flexoelectric coefficients? Well, it's a bit different to the second part. So maybe let's, I'll, I'll read it better. So maybe the first part of the question, how accurate is uh, this model of uh, effective charges, time displacements? Okay, so you know, if I if I go from configuration A to configuration B, and I go along a path, and at each point of the path, I recalculate the dynamical effective charges, and I integrate up the you know displacements of atoms times their dynamical effective charges evaluated at that point on the path, and I do the integral along the path, I get exactly the right answer. Uh, if I take the dynamical effective charges at the starting point and freeze the, you know, keep those values and then and then multiply them times the displacements and going from A to B, I get a pretty good approximation. Uh, if I, uh, you know, if I just uh, kind of uh, look up from the literature some uh, reasonable estimates of uh, dynamical effective charges, let's say in barium titanate, you know, the titanium is uh, anomalous, so it, let's put seven or something. I, I even then I get kind of reasonable uh, values. Um, I like to recommend that um, those estimates are extremely useful in situations where you might have some doubt about which is the right branch choice of the quantum. Um, you know, those kinds of estimates almost always put you in the neighborhood of the right branch choice. Um, <clears throat> so I, I would recommend it for that. Yeah. And for some purposes, if you just want, you know, um, something that's accurate to 10 or 15 percent, uh, may be good enough. Yeah. Thanks. And in fact, uh, the context of this uh, was, uh, you know, to do it uh, maybe at uh, super lattices uh, where you would use uh, bulk uh, effective charges. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because the, the second part of the question asks, uh, can we do the same for ferroelectricity? That is, can we use uh, 
flexoelectric coefficients uh, computed for bulk materials and the strain gradient uh, found in the super lattice. So, so the question is, how do we do? Yeah, yeah, I think so. And again, I mean, the flexoelectricity depends on more than just dynamical effective charge, uh, more, more than just dynamical uh, dipoles. It also depends upon dynamical quadrupoles. And there's a, a, a electronic piece, which is rather tricky to calculate. But, but again, I mean, I think it's, you know, if you can uh, calculate these things for small unit cells and then use them as an approximation of what happens in a big supercell, that's an entirely reasonable approach. Thanks. I think I have a last question myself and then we'll go to a pause. Uh, but you know, when you started with this uh, classical picture of uh, charge densities, uh, um, uh, it reminded uh, uh, me also of, you know, density functional theory, that is a quantum theory based on the charge density and the so-called GGG theorem that says that actually in a solid, uh, you know, what we have is a functional not of the charge density, but of the charge density and the polarization. So we always think at charge density, but that's not enough. The polarization is there. And so my question is, uh, how come we have, uh, you know, always been able to predict uh, the properties of ferroelectric materials, the polarization in solids, using uh, exchange correlation functionals uh, that, uh, you know, are uh, not, uh, do not have the polarization explicitly present. They are just uh, exchange correlation functional of the charge density. Well, yeah, uh, I think the short answer is um, that <laughs> there could be a very long answer. Um, a related question um, is um, if you calculate the polarization in exact cone jam theory, do you get the exactly correct polarization? And the short answer is not in general, but then you can ask, um, and I have a paper about this, there are some conditions in which in which the answer is yes and other conditions in which the answer is no. But anyway, then you can ask uh, if you calculate the electric polarization within our typical uh, exchange correlation approximations to uh, cone chan theory, um, uh, do you get the, the right uh, polarization? And our, you know, that's hard to answer, but our experience seems to be, you know, that it has the same kind of accuracy as other quantities, like kind of 5% accuracy, 5, 10% accuracy, similar to what we would get for computing, you know, uh, uh, you know, phonon frequencies or anything else. And so in, in practice, it seems to be that we don't have to worry about this. Um, it's, I, I think, the um, subtleties of the distinction between our um, uh, practical implementations of cone jam theory and exact cone jam theory are probably larger than the issue of uh, including the polarization into the functional. Okay, David, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I think uh, you know we'll we'll stop here for a pause. Uh, thank you again very much for this beautiful talk. Uh, um, we all go for coffee. Uh, and then uh, we meet again uh, in uh, seven, eight minutes at uh, four, ten uh, Central European time uh, for the talk of Raffaele Resta. Thank you again and see you everyone in uh, less than 10 minutes. Okay, so uh, welcome uh, back uh, everyone. And so this is uh, uh, for me a great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Professor Raffaele Resta. Uh, from the University of Trieste, that will be the other speaker in this uh, second Marvel classic. Uh, Raffaele holds uh, uh, a laurea degree from uh, the Scuola Normale Superiore in Pisa, that's the grande call for those that are familiar uh, with this concept in, in Italy. And uh, just after a graduation, he became an assistant professor in the University of Pisa, uh, where he stayed for a few years, his uh, uh, bio mentioned also sailing uh, semi-professionally. So we'll ask uh, later more about, uh, about uh, that. Uh, he moved uh, to the uh, newly funded uh, International School for Advanced Studies, studies in Trieste, CISA, uh, in 1981. Uh, and he has been a professor at the University of Trieste since uh, uh, 1994. Um, Raffaele is a fellow of the American Physical Society, uh, has been a divisional associate editor for uh, uh, physical radio letters, uh, and also has been a frequent uh, visitor to Lausanne. I uh, remember exactly at the same time uh, studying uh, intensely 
uh, is uh, lecture notes uh, for what was called uh, the Troisième Cycle. That was a special series of lectures uh, given here to the physics uh, students. Uh, so with this, give me great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Raffaele for uh, the second talk uh, of this uh, second Marvel classic. And uh, Raffaele, the floor is yours. Thank you. Let me see here. File. Open the same file. I have to share the screen. Am I already sharing or not? Not yet. Shit, I opened the file too soon. Let me see. I have to share the screen here. Share screen. Let me read your okay. title. I, I, I click here. That I will be polarization. I open, I open, and now I have this. Okay. And I enter full screen. Super. So it will be electric polarization, orbital magnetization and uh, other geometrical observables. So. I believe I'm set. Okay. Super. Okay. Fine. So you may notice my, my uh, affiliation also has a, a minor affiliation with uh, San Sebastian. Before the pandemics, I used it to spend there a couple of months, almost every year. We'll see what happens when the pandemics end. And uh, let's go back to the two uh, main material properties that David addressed. One is, uh, uh, I have this, uh, uh, one is polarization and one is magnetization. And the very trivial definition, which is given in, even in textbooks, is the dipole moment per unit volume, the uh, uh, orbital moment per unit volume. And of course, this uh, implicitly uh, requires a bounded system that is a finite crystalline, ideally even macroscopic, but definitely uh, bounded. And of course, this uh, cannot be used in condensed matter physics because in condensed matter physics, we use von von Karman periodic boundary condition. The problem, as was pointed out by David, is the operator R. Operator R is not an operator in the Hilbert space of periodic boundary condition because it maps a periodic function into a function which is not periodic. So you cannot, you cannot do uh, in, in general initial solid state physics. Furthermore, those integrals are dominated by surface contribution, of course, because, because there is an extensive uh, contribution from the surface we divided by volume. Uh, you have a, a, certainly a non negligible uh, contribution by the, the, the uh, surface. So if I cut a piece of, of the material in the bulk, really I cannot tell what polarization is for those two formulas. That is the reason why the problem was 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 so so uh, difficult. Condensed matter physics requires a completely different definition, and even today, most textbooks are playing wrong on the issue. They say, and maybe in, when we, we have the final part in the, in the, in the interview, we, we can say more about that. But the message that polarization has nothing to do with the density has not percolated into the literature. So our students still uh, learn something which is conceptually wrong. Now, uh, uh, these are the formula. David, I will explain below better what are the symbols. You see there is no position operator. There is no uh, mag magnetization would require a position and a current or a velocity. There is nothing like that. In particular, a polarization, you see, this is the formula which was flashed by David earlier, is just the derivative of the periodic part of the block orbitals. It is important to add the nuclei because uh, even for a finite system, the dipole is well defined only if the system is neutral. So you have to compute the dipole by, by, by uh, considering both the charge of the electrons and the charge of the nuclei, which must compensate. And in fact, this compensate, this part is classical. And the fact that the polarization is a well-defined, multi-valued observable, as David has uh, emphasized, it is only true when you consider both terms together, both terms together, otherwise it's no longer true. So both terms together, you have the polarization is the final modulo a quantum. 
this was the theory which came out in 92, published in 93. This was the most exciting <laughs> year of my professional life, of course. But uh, uh, many years afterwards, uh, that is uh, more than a decade afterwards, we, we teamed up with David and two uh, very uh, good young people, and we made the theory, the, the apparently analogous theory of forbidden harmonization. I say apparently analogous because have you seen the problem are the same. Going back to, I will not go back to the slide, but in previous slide, you see they are generally really, really very, very close friends, the two, the two are several. But then we discovered, and we started by analogy, we started by analogy, but uh, Working on that, we discovered that they are really they don't have really the same property. We have said uh, I, I, uh, since David had not said what what means geometrical, why these two formulas are geometrical. They are geometrical, in, roughly speaking, because the derivative of the wave function. But if you look at polarization, and you go back to what you learned at the, uh, in elementary quantum mechanics, in order to have an observable in quantum mechanics you need to have an operator. You have to invent uh, an operator, to define an operator such that what you observe is the uh, eigenvalue of the operator, is the expectation value of the operator or the like. Here, there is no operator. It's only the wave function, no, oper no operator at all. And still, this is observable. And in fact, this is a very phase, as, as even in the title of, in the title of our series. And uh, in the, in, if I should, uh, if somebody asks me, what is the message in, in a few words, the message of the very famous paper by Michael Berry in 84, I guess, I would say Berry uh, proves that in quantum mechanics, whenever you can build a gauge invariant expression, this in principle is measurable. So here we have a gauge invariant, we have a, a, a phase, a phase in quantum mechanics where, where neglected because they are in general not measurable, but if with the phase you can build up something which is a, a gauge invariant, then this in principle is measurable. And this is precisely the case. We have a, a, a very phase, a, a phase, uh, 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 if not clear to you why this is a phase, maybe to some of you, but in, in some sense it is clear, it depends only on property of the wave function across the driven zone. So if you know the wave function across the driven zone, you know the polarization, you don't need any operator. And uh, uh, orbital measurement is a bit more complicated. So we say both are geometrical because both have uh, a, a derivative of the block or, uh, orbitals, uh, periodic, periodic block orbitals. There are, notice that here there are two and here there is one, but they are geometrical in this sense because they have in common this feature. One important difference, just to start with, is that polarization is defined in insulators only. Orbital magnetization is, is defined also in metas. And both are geometrical in this sense, but I, you, you would see they are, they are rather different. Here, the ingredient besides, besides the, the uh, derivative of the orbital, you have also an Newtonian and eigenvalues. But David, uh, and I will speak afterwards also of the anomalous solar effect. In the anomalous solar effect, you don't have the Newtonian. So you have something which has in common with polarization the fact that you only have the derivative of the orbitals in order to define an observable. Now, uh, uh, these are similar, but you may, now here is the, 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 the plan of my lecture. I will try to touch some of those that is, uh, first of all, I see this part one will be within band structure theory. Band structure theory, I mean crystalline systems of non-interacting electrons in mean, in, in, uh, mean value sense. That means that means either Hartree-Fock or Konchan. So our orbitals are either Hartree-Fock and Konchan, and the interaction is 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 uh, kept only at the mean field uh, at the mean field uh, uh, level. For those, there are several observables. Over the years, uh, we, we understood that they have they have a geometrical character. Here, I listed a few, and I will discuss some of them. I will not not all of them. Uh, then uh, there are other. Uh, we can go beyond bus structure theory. One possibility is is uh, you have a disorder or a correlated system where you need a supercell. There is no longer a block vector. Routinely, calculation are computed with a gamma point only, so you you only have periodic function, okay, or if you want only one k. But uh, and uh, yet in this case, you focus on systems which are macroscopically homogeneous. 
I will say nothing of this part, uh, which where uh, uh, there have been results in the last uh, th almost 30 years, because the theory of polarization, as I say, starts in 92. That means we are 30, 30 years after that. There are results here. Not all of them, but some of them have a definition uh, in, in, uh, for both system. And the third, in which I will say something, if, if, I have, if uh, the time remains, is instead the reverse. That is, you have a system which is macroscopically inhomogeneous. Suppose you have a superlattice or a natural junction, you have a system which is partly uh, different polarization in different size, or different, partly metallic, partly insulating, or whatever, or different orbital magnetization. And you may ask, can you define a density? Can you identify the, the, this intensive, the intensive property you are you are looking at, you can identify by means of a density in a part only of the system. Clearly, with, with the k vector you cannot do, and not even with the supercell. You you get if you deal the, the heterojunction with the supercell, what you get is another edge property. We don't get you don't have spatial resolution. You you don't have the resolution to say that. So we have, uh, I, in the last years, I worked mainly in this. I will tell something if time remains, but if time remains because I want to go very slowly and to be uh, possibly pedantic. And so, uh, so I can cut easily uh, with no harm part of what came said. Now, going back to, uh, uh, so the outline is here. So the outline is here. Uh, I will convince you that the geometrical observables are very different from them and in particular, are uh, partitioned in two different classes. Of what I call here class one observables, the bulk value is the final module of the quantum. The quantum uh, uh, David was speaking about, which in dimensionless units, I would say this quantum is two pi. Then you have to see what are the dimensionless units. But, and then there are the class two observables, which instead are single valued and of, exempt for any quantum ambiguity. And as David has shown, my orbital magnetization is in this class. The anomalous quantity or conductivity is also in this class. Then, uh, and, and this will, will exhaust a large part of my time, uh, focusing on some class one observable and some class two observable, uh, always at, at, in, at the band structure level in the sense I specified. And then, if time remains, I will, I will show some, some, some only class two observable have, may have a local. Uh, local definition, local description, and density, and associated density. And uh, we, we, we uh, work on three of them, and I have, I have some slides about that. Now, let's go back to uh, what I've shown before, what I've shown before. The electronic part uh, of, of polarization is this integral, which I've said before is essentially a very phase, and, uh, and is the integral of a quantity which is called the Berry connection. Uh, this Berry connection is a geometrical property. It, it is gauge dependent. Uh, what does it mean gauge? Because we, we are speaking of gauge dependence, gauge invariance. Now, uh, gauge, uh, when you, one learns at second year gauge, you change the gauge and you change the, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, vector potential with M30 Hamiltonian. For a given magnetic field, you have a, a wide choice. And of course, the fact that in, in quantum mechanics, you have such kind of exotic effects came from the fact that you cannot write a shading equation directly in terms of the fields. While in classical mechanics, you write Newton equation just in terms of the field, uh, then vector potential may disappear. But in quantum mechanics, you, you, you cannot write a sharing equation with, with the field. Necessarily, you have to choose a gauge. And, and uh, in that gauge, you can compute wave function. Now, uh, uh, the wave function depends on the gauge. But, uh, and the Hamiltonian depends on the gauge, and the, and, and, and the wave function depends on the gauge. Once you have fixed the gauge of the Hamiltonian, you remain with a different, another uh, freedom is to have a, an arbitrary phase factor in, in front of each, uh, of each u vector. So you have a u vector. If you multiply u vector for any phase factor depending on k, uh, so uh, constant in space, but depending on k, this is still an acceptable, equally good, equally good 
uh, uh, wave function. And so this, even when you have fixed the Hamiltonian, so even when we have chosen the electromagnetic gauge, you still have an arbitrariness in this quantity. But this arbitrariness disappears when you, when you take the loop integral, essentially, of this very connection. But uh, it, 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 it is a phase. So in appropriate units, it is arbitrary modulo to pi. In units of polarization, it is a bit modulo a quantum. The magnetization does have this arbitrariness. Here on the bottom, I explain what are the notation. U has already been defined by David. The Hamiltonian HK is just the Hamiltonian which acts on the U, not the one which acts on the on the on the uh, psi. Uh, you have the Van der Axel Fermi level, and you notice that in this Hamiltonian, this kind of, kind of, something which resembles. A, a, a vector potential enters the Hamiltonian like a vector potential is a vector potential which does not depend on space, does not depend on time. So there is no electric or magnetic field associated, but still mathematically enters the, the, the formulas as vector potential. Now you may ask, uh, we were happy and uh, say we have found something similar. Well, it's not so similar because of the reason I say, but really, uh, really similar. And I will show they could not be more different. That is, polarization uh, holds, uh, makes sense in insulators only. Orbital magnetization makes sense in both insulators and metals. The integrand is gauge dependent in, in the sense I've, I've said before for uh, polarization. It is gauge invariant instead in, in the sense I said before for, for, the, uh, for the magnetization. Is the integral of one form? What I mean, one form here, I will uh, a rather sloppy definition. A one form is a differential form which has only one derivative in this sense. A one form in general would be would have one differential and one derivative. And when you include the coefficient on the form times the differential, you have a dimension. But of course, this is only true in one dimension, not in three. If you integrate in three, uh, the differential is, is area. So, so let me say very sloppily, a one form has only one derivative of a function. A two form has two derivative of a function. And this, as you will see, is a very strong difference. Then at the most fundamental level, polarization is a one-dimensional phenomenon. I can imagine, I can define for sure polarization of a linear polymer. And I can also imagine that a solid is built as, a, as an array of interacting polymers. So it is one-dimensional. And instead, magnetization is two-dimensional. At, 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 as a minimum, you have, we must have uh, electrons two dimensions and, and, and magnetization normal to this direction. The bulk value of polarization is, is multiply valued, is multiply valued, and instead the, the magnetization is single valued. Now, if you think with the boundary, you can alter the value of T by a quantum, but can be altered by a quantum. Instead, if you think with the boundary, there is no way of altering the value of magnetization. So these are extremely uh, opposite uh, uh, properties. Why? This is pro prototype of class one uh, uh, or uh, observable. There is another one, which is a, a very close relative of this. And there are, to my knowledge, no other ones known. And instead, in, in class two, there are several, in particular, orbital magnetization and anomalous or conductivity, the ones we, which we, we address later and also addressed by that. Now, uh, uh, Modern mathematics knew this very, very long before physicists, as often happens. That is, the modern ge differential geometry developed in half first century, uh, first half of the 20th century, with result by Contrary and Cartan Veil, Chem Simons. In particular, the most important result by Simons is, uh, came out, I guess, in uh, 1974, the Chem Simons famous paper. And they, they studied those forms, the forms, uh, so one forms in dimension one, two forms in dimension two, three forms in dimension three, and so forth. And then the key main message uh, to, to learn from this, from this mathematics is that the two n forms, so that means the forms uh, in, 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 and the two n minus one forms, that is even an odd dimension, they behave in a quite different way. And in particular, if you focus only on the anti-symmetric forms, so the, 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 the forms where the coefficients are anti-symmetric, the function of the coordinates, 
In the symmetric case, you can define in dimension 2n, you define what is called the first chain form and also the first chain number, which is in our domain becomes a TKNN invariant. Uh, and David spoke about that. In, 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 instead, if in, in 2n minus 1 dimension, there are completely different kind of forms, but they are related. That is, in, in, if you, in the simplest case, if you go to 1 to 2, you take the, the first uh, chain Simon form, you take the, the curl, and you get the first chain form, and so on, going, going on with dimension. Now, in physics, we have only three dimensions, at most four, if you, if you uh, wish to add the time. But mathematicians, of course, they go to n as high as you like. And this is the main reason, essentially, why polarization and magnetization are so different. Because one is a one four, and the theory needs a one four, the other one needs a two four. So this is what I, I've shown before, is the quantity which you have seen already many times today. And this is a, a chain simons one, one four. More exactly, for a mathematician, a chain simons one form will have the decay and to multiply, and we will only be addressing one dimension. It will not even, even have the i. Because with the eye, it becomes real. Without the eye, it's purely imaginary, but there's no problem. If you take the curl, just, uh, just the regular curl, the normal curl, you have this and, and uh, this uh, simple formula is written for only one band in one dimension, and this oh. is written for only one band in two dimensions. The orbital magnetization obtains, as you have seen before, from a two form which is closely related to this one. This one, as it is, without, without modification, is the one which gives you the anomalous Hall effect, both and also the quantizable Hall effect in, in, in non-anomal. I would say the quantizable Hall effect, the anomalous Hall effect, and the quantizable anomalous Hall effect, all kind of Hall effect in a sense. But now, since we live in a three-dimensional world, so you may ask, does a Chern-Simons tree form have any physical meaning? And in fact, some very clever people found that it does. And it, 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 it has the same properties of uh, polarization. Now, uh, why? What does it mean that is defined in module to pi? In some sense, it has been explained already by David, but I want to uh, to to elaborate more on this. The bulk polarization is a lattice. This was specified. This is a second. Notice that this is a second of the two famous papers by King Smith and Vanderbilt. There is a King Smith and Vanderbilt first, and then Vanderbilt and Smith is the second. In the second, they say that polarization is a lattice, not a vector. And what is important, whenever you have a bounded sample, the value of P is ambiguous until uh, sample specification is, uh, sample termination is specified. So uh, when, you, when you truncate a, a, a crystal with a given crystal structure, it is nature who chooses which is the value of polarization. It is amongst the value permitted by the bulk theory, it is the value that makes the energy minimum. You will see an example of that. For a one-dimensional system, the polarization is the dimension of a pure charge because it is a dipole over a length. And uh, it, the formula is particularly simple. It is E over 2 pi times gamma, which is a phase, which is the final model 2 pi. And this must include the nuclei, as I said you. And now suppose we have an inversion symmetric material, an inversion symmetric polymer. Then you need P equal minus P. But since polarization is a lattice, you only need the lattice to be symmetric, not really the value itself. And the lattice could be symmetric in two very different ways. One is a polarization is zero modulo E, the other one is one half modulo E. And this is mapped one to one into the additive group of the integer modulo two. That means it is a Z2 observable. Arguably is the simplest and more elementary example of Z2 invariant, topological Z2 invariant. But we will explain also why it is topological. But we made the simulation in polyacetylene several years ago with, with Roberto Carr and, 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 and Konstantin Kudin in Princeton. And uh, just to demonstrate, this was published in General Chemical Physics because this was to, to, to improve the literacy of quantum chemistry about this. So, so the, the, the paper was written avoiding very phases and exotic stuff. Just we took two very long molecules. This was polyacetylene with some termination. And this was the same polyacetylene with different termination. We noticed that the bulk is centrosymmetric. So the theorem applies. This must be the polarization must be either zero modulo one or one half modulo one. 
But of course, whenever the realization is finite, the two molecules are both asymmetric, and so the dipole will be not zero at finite uh, length. The quantization only appears in the long chain limit. And this is the result. So the constant including uh, used Gaussian code. The Gaussian code, you get the coordinates and, and, and some information about the basic set. And the Gaussian code tells you what the dipole is. The dipole per monomer was here. And since the lattice constant was 4.7, you can easily see that for this material, uh, the polarization is either 0 or 1 uh, of one charge, E, one charge. Because, why? Because polyacetylene is in Z2 even category. That means uh, that polarization, if you do a very phase calculation and we include the nuclei, polyacetylene polarization is zero modulo uh, one. Now, uh, what are the other class? Well, it is like this. Polyacetylene, you can simplify with this simply simple sketch. Also, if you take a, a series of hydrogen molecule on a row, you get the sign and polarization is zero modulo T. Instead, if you model a, 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 a ionic crystal, you, you have a plus and minus, plus and minus. Uh, this is the case, the other case. Is in, is, the invariant is topological. That is, it's robust by continuous deformation of the wave function. So you can switch from a, a simple uh, tight banding uh, Hamiltonian to a full interacting correlated whatever Hamiltonian, this invariant cannot change, cannot change insofar as the system remains insulated. So it's independent of the theory level. And there was something earlier which, which was due exactly to the same reasons, a very, very important paper by uh, Sushriten and Higer about the, the sol quantized soliton exactly in polyacetic. Now, this is a simple exercise uh, uh, that if you, if you take uh, the simplest model of this, that is uh, uh, one site, uh, one orbital per site, uh, one dimensional tight banding, you have, two you have two parameters. Here you have alternating hopping T and T prime. And if you want to preserve central symmetry, you need to take the on site uh, uh, elements constant or even zero. Instead, here, if you want to, to preserve central inversion symmetry, you will have to keep constant hopping and make alternatives. This is protected by inversion symmetry, sorry. And uh, uh, you, you can try the exercise because it is diagonalizing a two by two matrix. You realize that if you try to, to, to transform with continuity, the Hamiltonian which gives this into the Hamiltonian which gives this, necessarily at some point you close the gap. If you, if you want to keep it centrosymmetric. So, so if you keep, the, there is no way of keeping the material centrosymmetric and moving from and, and transforming with continuity this situation into this situation without closing the gap. Now uh, we, we need, in order to go ahead, we need uh, uh, to do something a little bit more sophisticated. This is the connection, but we're off diagonal terms. So the diagonal is the very connection. You have an abelian matrix. And now, as I said, what is the, the uh, three form, which is in, in, see, the, the one, the, the polarization one dimensional system, including nuclei, can be the electron term, let's say, forget about nuclei, can be written like this. Here I include the differential in this formula. So, and this is exactly a Chen Simons one form uh, by definition. Now, the Chinese sum of three forms, in, in, if you go to Wikipedia, they have a very nice, compact, uh, compact uh, simple form. Uh, if you convert the mathematics, uh, mathematician formula into uh, Brill zone integral, you have this rather ugly thing. This sounds you have to do that mathematician use very synthetic, very compact notation, but this is, is nothing new with respect to mathematician new since 1974. This is something like a high order very phase because this is an angle that is something which is dimensionless and it is uh, defined a model to pi. And there are three derivatives, you see, because you have a, the, 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 the uh, connection as one derivative, the connection as uh, the, the, again, so you see there are three derivatives. So it's a three form. And does theta have a difficult meaning? The answer was found in, in 2008 by a, G, uh, Hughes, and Zang. So this is as a mathematical. I mean, what is this, this meaning? Well, 
uh, the important point, besides the meaning, I would say in my view, more than the meaning is important what happens when you have either uh, in time reversal symmetry or inversion symmetry, because like in the case of polarization, analogous to the case of polarization, it is only possible to have zero on pi modulo two pi. And this, uh, uh, the reason why this is very, very important is because it, it is a way of classifying the three-dimensional topological insulator. If, if it is even, so if this number is zero modulo pi, it is trivial. And if it is Z2O, it is a, 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 a non-trivial topological insulator, which is called a strong topological insulator. This is the case where it is time reversal and symmetric. You can do also, you can also instead imagine, uh, take only the case with an inversion symmetry. And this is called an axial insulator. As far as I know, this has not yet been discovered in uh, synthesized. Instead, the strong topological insulator has been synthesized. Uh, David has some papers about that, so maybe uh, correct me if it has been found, the axial insulator, but I think it has not been found so far. Now, the physical property associated is, is not really interesting. It's not really interesting because it's the only one part of the effect and experimentally would be very difficult to, to, to isolate that part of the effect. So I will not tell what the physical effect is. But then you see the table of all the class one observable we know of. There are two angles, both the final model to pi, both in insulator only, and all at this form general where the integral is a gauge dependent two n minus one four. The bulk value is defined at modulo 2 pi. For a bounded sample, the, the actual value depends on termination. And if you have some protecting symmetry, both uh, are, become topological invariants. Now let's move to, I have less than a minute, so let me go a little bit fast. The example which are exempt from for ambiguity, uh, here is my table, all of them. I will discuss only anomalous whole conductivity and maybe, uh, maybe the, the uh, sorry, orbital magnetization. They, are, they have this structure. The observable is, is again the integral of a, of a form, but the form is a two form, not, not a one form or a three form. There is no modulo two ambiguity. For a bounded sample, the actual value is independent of termination. You may think that with the boundary as much as you want, you cannot change the value of this. And you may, and also let me anticipate, since I will not show in this talk, they admit a local representation, they admit a density. So you can forget about the k-vector and, and you can define them even if you have a, a, a homogeneous system like an, a, a neutral structure, why you cannot do that for polarization. Now, you notice in this table, I, 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 on the same row, I have actually the same differential form, symmetric, anti-symmetric part. And there are also two sum rules. I will not explain why a sum rule is actually, you can, you can, you, some rule is an excitation property, it's not a ground state property, but at the end, if you integrate over the frequencies, an, an excitation property becomes a ground state property. Now, uh, uh, again, there are T odd and T even. Uh, uh, it, it, we notice that the T odd Essentially, they, you have the same formula for metal and insulator. They don't care whether you have metals or insulator. They are actually the same formula. But instead, they even do, are different. One, of, one is defined for insulators only. One is defined for metal only. It is in metal, in insulator, the weight is trivially zero. And in, in the, the sum rule here is infinite, uh, formally diverges. The reason has to do with whether there is or not a Fermi surface. Fermi surface make this, uh, but this Fermi surface is yes, ineffective on the left hand, on the anti-symmetric. Now, uh, uh, it is possible to cast them in gauge invariant form, but this is a projector on, on the U states. Uh, of course, uh, only determines the occupied manifold of block states, doesn't care uh, which state are occupied, does, doesn't care about band crossing on the like. And since the quantity uh, we are looking for are gauge invariant, they must be expressible as derivative of, of PK. And uh, since the class two observable are rooted in two form, all observables in the class and must have two derivatives of P. And in fact, is here, orbital magnetization, this is the formula shown before, the formula we arrived at in 2006 and the formula you find in, in, in David's uh, textbook, but it can be shown with some work that it can be written in this way, where, where only gauge invariant quantities enter, that is the gradient of the 
project. Now, let's go to to the simplest of all. The simplest is is the 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 simplest is the, 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 there is no Hamiltonian inside. You simply take the curl of the of, of the problem. More exactly, you take the most general tensor, which has, which has a symmetric and anti-symmetric part. The, the, the symmetric part is the metric, which is also important, but I, I will not discuss here. We focus on the anti-symmetric part, which is the Berry curvature, and it is the gradient. It is the curl of the uh, of the connection. Uh, let's uh, well the symmetric part. Uh, well, I can do this. Uh, in the year 2000, uh, Susan Wilkins and Martin proposed to discriminate insulators and metal looking at this integral. This integral, of course, is 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 finite in any insulators. Is it diverges in in all metals, and in the case with it, when it is finite. It is a measurable quantity. It is uh, the, uh, it is a gauge invariant property, of course, and it is a ground state. It can be shown. It is a ground state property. So, in order to measure, you you cannot you don't have a probe acting on the ground state. You have to measure conductivity of these insulators as a function of omega. As a matter of principle, you have to integrate. But finally, this is a ground state property. It's just a Brillouin zone integral of the quantum matrix. And some of you know that this matrix enters the theory of marzari van der Bill, one year function, very famous 1997 paper. Right. Now, uh, in insulators, uh, I take, I, I consider metals as well. So this is the very, uh, the very, uh, very curvature, even for a metal, I sum up to the Fermi surface, the very curvature. And the intrinsic hole conductivity can be written in this way in two dimension, in three dimension for insulator for metals. And when you go to, to the special case of an insulator in two dimension, you have an integral of the whole Brillouin zone. And this, you can try here, you notice here there's an H bar, but it becomes an H with the count all of factor pi. Finally, what is in red is one over two pi times the integral over a compact manifold of the very, uh, connection, uh, very curvature. This is is a, an integer because of a famous theorem due to Chern in 1940, I guess, or at least in 1940. So this is a topological integer. Now, in metals, in metals, you you have uh, the anomalous effect uh, exists in in in, uh, in metals. It was discovered by Hall himself in 81, 80, 1881. There are for sure a tricy contribution. The theory was in, uh, was controversial until 2000. He was, uh, despite a, a, despite a pioneering work by Lottinger, uh, uh, um, it was assessed uh, without no doubt that there is a geometrical contribution only in the early 2000. And in fact, with hindsight, it is just the same formula as for insulator, just uh, just uh, uh, adopted to metals where it is no longer quantized but still has the same as the same uh, uh, effect. Now, uh, as I say, I have no time in, uh, because I'm running over time. So the local network of class two observer I will not discuss. And I will go to the complete, let, well, I will just let me discuss at least this. Local network means that you have something like that. And if you know what happens here, only here, can you tell what is the observable? And the answer is yes, if it is orbital initiation, yes, if it is a normal whole conductivity, no, if it is polarization. Because polarization, you, if you know what happens here, you only know polarization modulo a quantum, and the actual value of the quantum is fixed by, by what happens at the boundaries here, at the boundaries here. So I, I pursued a, a program, which I started in 2011 with uh, Raffaello Bianco, and then I continued with other, uh, my other very talented student, both very talented students, in in, in following years, uh, to to really to 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 find the form of this observable and to demonstrate that they work correctly. But uh, I will show you no, no, nothing of those results, and I will jump to the connections. Uh, maybe this is useful. Orbital magnetization. This is the formula I've shown earlier. We could demonstrate it can be written in this alternative way. The integral is the same. So it's in spirit is similar to integration by parts, but the integration by parts reshuffles the integrand in different uh, spaces, such a way that if you use this, 
a, a density this can you can look at this as the integral of a density this cannot be looked at as the integral of a density because it's dominated by what happens at the surface okay and then uh, uh, as i promised to go to the conclusion so the conclusion is that the geometrical nature of several intensive observables have, have been elucidated over the years even beyond band structure theory uh, so that means even beyond crystalline uh, uh, systems in a, in a, in a uh, midfield uh, scheme. And then when you specialize uh, to, to, the, to the crystalline system, so you specialize to what I call the bandings later band metals in short means what I said before, you have, uh, we discovered that there are Two, two very different classes, which have very, very different features. And some features uh, are hold only for what I would say, essentially one dimensional observable or essentially three dimensional observables. And the other properties very different, which I focus on only hold for a system where, where in very essence, the phenomenon is two dimensional and they're based on um, and with this, I thank you for your attention and I'm ready to answer your questions. Thank you, Raffaele, for uh, this uh, very beautiful and insightful talk. Uh, um, so as before, uh, people are uh, uh, very much welcome uh, to write questions in the question and answer, uh, or also to raise their hands and then uh, I'll uh, unmute them and uh, they can, uh, they can uh, chip in. Um, I'll also start uh, from uh, from the uh, question and answer. Uh, thank you for the very nice talk. My question is, uh, if R is not a proper operator in a periodic system, how should we interpret the exponential factor e to the i k r appearing in block functions? Um, and the second question is that in what circumstances so should we use non-abelian Berry connection or curvature? Well, and, and, and let me answer to the first, then I, I miss the second. The, the answer to yeah. the first is, is, is sorry. you have something which is not an operator, but then if you take exponential i, this quantity which is not operator becomes an operator. And, and which is in particular, if you think, if you, Forget about the, the the k, but if you if you have uh, if you have a periodic boundary condition over length l, then of course uh, x is not an operator, but exponential i i uh, x times uh, time uh, uh, to pi over l. This is a periodic function. So some combination of uh, an illegitimate operator can become a legitimate operator. This is the answer. Yeah. And let's say what the second part of the question. Uh, yeah, yeah. Paula? So the second part is uh, under uh, which uh, circumstances uh, uh, should we use a non abelian Berry connection or curvature? Uh, well, for sure, we, we, we use numerically, that is the computer codes, actually the computer codes we, which, which compute polarization uh, do not, distinct, do not uh, distinguish bands. So they only, they only uh, uh, deal with all of the occupied bands together. It is not important when you have a band crossing, it's not, to, it's not important where to continue in order to define the, 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 uh, the connection. So it means the, the, the algorithms which are commonly used in, in the electronic structure code, in fact, are non-abelian. They compute, uh, uh, eventually they compute, so they deal with non-abelian phase, and actually what they only need is the trace of, of those uh, of those quantity, but, but they, they are in the non -abelian. Then if you want uh, to go instead to, to the topological, so to the, 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 the chern simon form, then the chern simons invariant is non-trivial only if you have a non-abelian, only in the non-abelian phase. Thanks, Raffaele. I'll, I'll keep reading, but uh, again, uh, people are really welcome uh, to, to raise their hands. I saw a lot of, uh, you know, friends uh, and colleagues uh, over, uh, uh, over there. And so uh, another question says, uh, uh, class one and class two observables. Uh, uh, are these uh, comparable when a global gauge can be defined uh, via Stokes theorem? And 
uh, yes, in a sense, yes. That is, uh, the observable of class one, uh, in general, uh, uh, particularly in the, tri in, in the topological non-trivial cases, a global gauge cannot be established. That's the point. You need to have an obstruction. So for class one and class two observable, uh, uh, in the non-trivial cases, you need to have an obstruction. And class two is that the, uh, the obstruction have no role, essentially. essentially. Thanks, Raffaele. And um, another question, what about the real part of the Berry curvature? Is there any meaning to it? No, the Berry curvature is real in the sense it, is, is, uh, it comes from I times the asymmetric part of the matrix, which is purely imaginary. Ah, I say, but the, the, I know I understand what you're saying. We have the, the, the metric curvature tensor, so the real part would be the metric part. The real part is the metric, and the imaginary part is the curvature. Okay, thanks. Now, another question. Uh, so, uh, a rigorous definition of the local polarization doesn't work, but uh, uh, local dipole models uh, have been very effective, say, in empirical models of uh, water uh, using uh, exactly a local molecular dipole. So can you comment on the limits uh, when, uh, say, a local dipole picture breaks down? Yes, the limit is, is in uh, when, uh, whenever you have a bound, uh, water is a, a rather strange uh, uh, molecular liquid, so water is special for several reason, but in, if you have a molecular solid or a molecular liquid, you actually have an interstitial region around, which is almost, you can assume it is empty, so you can do what David has shown in his picture with his small dipoles, so you have molecular crystal, the dipole of a, of, a, of a molecule is defined in, in some sense with a good approximation and also in a, in a liquid. Water is a bit special because of the uh, water is the most complex liquid of all because of hydrogen bond. Uh, this picture is rather complicated. In fact, we worked with, we had a, a few papers with, in collaboration with Roberto about the, on, on the infrared spectra of, of ab initial infrared spectra of water. The first paper, by the way, has been done on this line, has been done by Michele in, in, in Silvestrelli and uh, Bernasconi in 1997 and 1998 and that was done with a single point very phase i've not spoken about that but they they maybe this I, i'm moving a little bit in the next section but i think it's a good point uh, silvestrelli called me or sent me an email can we compute the very phase with one point because they they were running single single uh, gamma point uh, the simulation they wanted to compute the interest spectrum that way and I answer it, no, well, we cannot because a phase with one point has no, has no meaning, at least two. And, 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 and then I went home and then thinking, when I came back to the office, I had a very small tight binding code. Uh, I, was, I was showing that uh, if I have one cell and eight points or a supercell, double supercell, four points, uh, quadruple supercell, two point, and so on, I got, got the same result with 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 in uh, with the uh, computer activists. And then I came back, I had the do loop, I made the do loop uh, going to one point, and it was working. But the, the puzzle remained. So the, the, the paper came later. I, I was struggling uh, probably almost two years about how, because the, the analytical proof of that result was not so easy. And and when I arrived and I proof that came through a more general so with a special case of a more general theory, maybe you know my paper on the single point very phase. But for the single point very phase, I had a computational experiment which told me that is correct. This is important the way we work in computational physics. You have an experiment and you don't know the result. You discover the result and then you have to understand why you have that result. Yeah. Thank you, Raffaele. And maybe the last question to keep ourselves on time on this uh, more scientific part. Uh, polarization and magnetization are uh, related uh, in uh, relativistic theory. So what about uh, Lorentz invariance? Well, we are doing non-relativistic quantum mechanics and Schrodinger equations. So I, 
uh, I have uh, in Matigas, uh, we have to do that. In Matigas, the Lawrence invariant, still you have the material must be addressed, or you have to be in the reference frame of the material. So we are, we are, we are not doing a, a electromagnetism in vacuum. I guess I'll uh, confess my ignorance then, because how can you combine, uh, you know, one form and two form uh, into, you know, a single quadrivector or whatever into a single relativistic? Well, Chad Simon theory are, are uh, by now a staple in high energy physics uh, when you increase the time, and 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 they, they do that. They, they do that. Okay, um, Raffaele, I also thank you very much. So what I would suggest is uh, uh, we stop here, the more scientific part of the talk. Uh, that was wonderful. I also suggest that we take a four minute pause uh, just to, to give everyone, uh, you know, sort of a, a, a little bit of a pause. And then I would say uh, with this beautiful picture, uh, we start again uh, in uh, four or five minutes uh, and uh, we do, uh, you know, more, uh, uh, I would say, relaxed and uh, general conversation about uh, the field, uh, how it started, uh, and, uh, you know, I'll ask uh, some questions about uh, the development of what has happened. So thank you again, uh, both of you very much for this, and uh, see you, I would say, in five minutes, uh, Charles. Great. I think uh, this is uh, uh, meant uh, to be also more informal. Uh, so I think I'll just uh, remove uh, my uh, background. So welcome back, uh, uh, David and uh, Raffaele. Uh, so the spirit uh, of, uh, of these uh, classics is also to give uh, new audiences uh, a sense of, uh, you know, what it was uh, to uh, develop uh, this uh, this uh, kind of science and this research. So actually one thing I have asked uh, uh, both uh, David and Raffaele is uh, to give us uh, some uh, recollections on how all of this uh, started uh, and uh, if they can help us, uh, you know, go back uh, to the, you know, early and I would say fairly pioneering years of uh, electronic structure research. And I think uh, David might even have uh, some slides of a more lighthearted nature, and maybe Raffaele also has some. But maybe David, you could start and you know share with us, uh, in general, your thoughts uh, going back, uh, you know, a few years. So let's put it this way. Okay. Um, thanks. Uh, yeah, I really appreciate the opportunity um, to do this. This is uh, this is fun. So I just have a few slides that I wanted to um, uh, put up here. Um, uh, first of all, I just, uh, you know, there are so many um, seminal contributions that came before um, that uh, sort of laid the groundwork. I think people know about Walter Cohn's work on the theory of the insulating state and, and so many related things. Um, Eugene Blount at Bell Labs um, struggled with um, uh, how to tame the position operator in the block representation and, and did so in, in his own way. Uh, Joshua Zek, uh, basically had the berry phase in his hands, uh, but um, was using it in a different way to characterize symmetries of band structures. Uh, David Fowlis, of course, um, did seminal work on the quantum Hall effect and adiabatic charge transport that uh, we should have been paying more attention to, but weren't really paying more attention to. But, you know, n none of these people, uh, you know, solved the problem of computing polarization and ferroelectrics. And uh, our community did, and 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 why is that? Uh, I, I just want to make the point here that, you know, when you're in a computational community and you're doing calculations on real materials, barium titanate, and there's actual uh, <clears throat> interest in uh, understanding polarization in these materials, uh, and we know how to calculate A, B, C, and D, and when then we find that we don't know how to calculate E. It's really annoying. <laughs> and so that's how it was in the early 1990s. Uh, we actually knew how to calculate derivatives of polarization with respect to, let's say, atomic displacements, so that was dynamical charges or electric fields, that's the susceptibility, the linear response um, uh, you know, theory was well, well, well developed. But to calculate polarization itself um, was a, a real challenge. So I, I think really the necessity of, of coming up 
I mean, to really understand something, if you can implement it in a computer algorithm to actually calculate it, it means you really understand it. And so that's sort of what happened in our, in our community. Uh, I want to flash up uh, uh, the King Smith Vanderbilt paper. Uh, some people asked me why this di didn't get into PRL. It was certainly uh, submitted to PRL, but I have to admit in retrospect, it was rather dryly uh, written. Um, and uh, I, I think we, in part, this was Dominic, I think didn't want to um, be uh, too aggressive, but you know, maybe we should have written the introductory paragraph to say this is a paradigm changing this, that, and the other. But it was in this paper we derived formulas for calculating changes. The method is suited to first principles calculations, blah, blah, blah. So I think it's on us in a way that, but of course, this paper is now extremely highly cited. So it got its due in the end. I also want to pay attention to the date this was submitted, June 1992. What's significant about that date, <clears throat> of course, is that it follows Raffaella's. Uh, classic uh, paper here uh, that was um, presented uh, at a workshop on ferroelectrics uh, in uh, the Williamsburg series. So um, I think this um, may have been uh, the second, first or second Williamsburg workshop that I went to, and I brought along uh, my um, promising uh, postdoc, Dominic Kingsmith. Um, and at that uh, uh, Williamsburg workshop in February 92, uh, Raffaella presented this this paper that basically had the equation that said that change of polarization could be found by integrating along a path of, you know, dpd lambda along a path. And the question that was discussed at the workshop is, does it depend upon path? And so while we were following our own path from Williamsburg back to New Brunswick, uh, that's a, a five hour uh, plus uh, car trip. So we had lots of time to talk to each other. And I remember the whole time we were discussing this issue and we were uh, thinking, <clears throat> yes, it must be, it must be the same, but maybe it's only the same modulo quantum and what, what, how, what could that mean and so on. So this was a very exciting, uh, very exciting time. Um, the Williamsburg workshop was followed by other workshops, but I also want to emphasize that the subsequent um, uh, developments, and uh, by the way, our chairman, uh, Nicola, was involved in many of these, um, were enormously um, supported by the uh, CCAM workshops that uh, at that time were all in uh, Lyon, which was a wonderful place to visit also, by the way. Uh, there was this 1995 one on theory of polarization, then some on Wannier functions, anomalous Hall effect, more on maximally localized Wannier functions. All of these topics are really rather closely related in terms of their uh, formal structure. Um, and I'll just end by showing uh, this uh, lovely um, uh, uh, photo that N Nicola found. Uh, so this is from the 1999, one of these CCAM workshops. And so uh, the two speakers here and our chairman, here we are uh, 20 uh, years uh, ago. And you also see Walter Cohn, who was really the father of the field and a, a great influence on all of us. And there's Joshua Zach. Uh, he was really, um, it, it was really interesting to have him at the workshop. He was. He, most of the people at the workshop were from our computational electronic structure community, and, and he was not. And so he, <clears throat> every time we would take something for granted, he would say, no, that, why do you believe that? I mean, someone made a, a statement about, well, we calculate the first order change of charge density with electric field. And Joshua Zach said, no, 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 that's not well defined. And then we said, yes, it is. And he said, no, it can't be. And then there was this discussion that would go on for 45 minutes. And it was wonderfully valuable for all of us because it helped us understand what what we could count on and what we couldn't count on. And when when we had convinced Joshua Zach of something, we were really satisfied that it was correct. So that's all I had uh, uh, to, 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 to present um, for you. And I'll, I'll have more to say probably in answer to the questions that come up later. But uh, that's my uh, my little uh, initial blurb. Thanks, uh, thanks, uh, David. Uh, and and uh, I have to say, uh, having uh, had a lift uh, on your car, driving actually from, uh, uh, I think it was DC, you picked me up in DC to Williamsburg, uh, I realized uh, that, uh, you know, you are actually much more an Italian driver than an Anglo-Saxon driver. And I was <laughs> absolutely terrified. So I find it very <laughs> remarkable that actually, you know, all these ideas could be developed uh, during uh, 
uh, during uh, uh, during uh, such a road uh, road uh, trip. Um, I think Rafael has also some yeah, uh, uh, recollection. How, let me share the screen. Yes, uh, thanks. Uh, before sharing the screen, I say something uh, adding to the to the second. Uh, since the, I was the co-organizer of all, all of those workshops uh, mentioned by David, I always try to have in, in the audience people outside our community. So sometimes we have mathematical physicists like uh, George Tazak and others, and other times we had quantum chemists. So I tried to enlarge our, our the, the second, I, I was thinking that the second workshop was the ideal place to gather also people which did, uh, did not know about the theory, did not know about the development and to learn also something from that. Then after that, let me share the screen because uh, the, all, all, all happening in 92, David had said something, I will say something more about what happened in 92, but let's say two important things before 92. Uh, before 92, so before I met David, of course, <laughs> this is, uh, it is here. Uh, this is a paper which appeared in February 74 by Richard Martin. Is a comment, is a negative comment on a wrong paper. I should uh, let me enter the uh, full screen, maybe. And the author of this paper was not what in Italia we would call a Pellegrino. He was the author of uh, one of the authors, uh, probably the senior author of the reference book in Lattice Dynamics, and he said something really incorrect. And Richard Martin tells in this paper uh, very, very sharply and demonstrate very simply, polarization of a crystal cannot be derived solely in terms of the charge density unit cell in an infinite periodic crystal. So this statement was demonstrated very clearly. And this statement still has not percolated, as I said before, to, our, to the textbooks on which our students study. So this is what the way. Now, uh, the, the, the lattice dynamic effect of charge are linear response properties. So the macroscopic, the induced macroscopic polarization was a problem which in the 70s and 80s had been mostly solved in several ways. Uh, um, via linear response theory, uh, the first directory matrices, then the, the baroni janozzi test approach, which was extremely powerful, it was developed in, in the 80s. But still, one baffling uh, part was the spontaneous. What is a spontaneous polarization? So it is measured in interelectric. So we have to, to have to understand what it is. First of all, we have to compute to see what it is. But in fact, this was, as you then say, the change of paradigm. We have to define uh, uh, in a different way than in textbooks. And, and that was the starting of the theory. And now before moving, so there is a, another important paper, but I, I have a deviation here, you know, we won a prize with that paper in 1990. The Savant à l'honneur, the Savant à l'honneur were uh, uh, Michel Kosternak, uh, Alfonso Balderesti and me. And you may notice that there was a prize, a people's prize, 20,000 Swiss francs in this prize. So, so before boarding my train, I went to the prize ceremony and then before boarding my train to Trieste, I cashed the check and my share was 6,600 uh, 6, francs. I went to Bucherer here, place of Saint Francois, and I came with a watch for my very, very wonderful wife, Lucia. And, and uh, she, she was wearing this, even not this picture, I, on purpose, this picture is, is on my large uh, archive from 1992. 1992 is exactly the year of the of the of the very face. We are not seeing the picture. We are seeing a Richard Martin's uh, paper. Why? I, I, on my screen, I see. I see the, the. You don't see that? No. Maybe try to stop share and share again. Maybe. Oh yeah, there it is. Uh, the same or cry. Yeah. Now we see. It. But I, if I, if I go into full screen, you don't see anymore. Let me go. I was. In, I, I had this, but into full screen. Full screen mode. Do you see this? Do you see the? Do you see the previous slide? We see the Seymour Cray prize. Uh, it didn't go to full screen uh, though, but we let see me, it let, well. let, let me keep the screen. If you you see the old slide in this way, you see the old slide. I guess you see. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. So that remains like at this level. So so uh, I spent the money here, and this is the uh, the, the watch. Uh, which is in fact the same or pay price was always uh, here. The picture was taken in 92. 92 is the year when uh, the very face. 
notice that uh, Croatia was at war. So there were the, the war in Croatia, the Yugoslavian wars, but uh, the island was very safe. The front was rather far away from the island. So we were there even with, with, with a rather costly watch. We, we didn't fear to be robbed. Now, what the work, work is about is here. This is a, this is a, the zone Irma because the Irma is is the acronym of the lab at that time, and we for the very first time we we were able to compute spontaneous polarization. As I told you, induced polarization, linear induced polarization was something we could solve it by the time, very very accurate in several ways, but spontaneous. And then uh, uh, this is not yet the, the final idea. This is a brute force calculation, but uh, the, the message we gave here, this is the journal, this is Flash. Any, anyhow, this is Flash is the journal. I don't know whether it's called it still Flash, the weekly journal of the students of FFN. But here in Flash, we wrote in French, I translate from the phenomenological viewpoint, spontaneous polarization is not something which can be measured uh, like an, uh, as an intrinsic uh, properties of the equilibrium state, because experimentally you only measure variation of T. That is uh, uh, piezoelectricity, piezoelectricity, piezoelectricity. The, the, the fundamental idea of this work is in order to obtain the value of T, uh, use equally the, the concept of difference. And our numerical experiment uh, was actually not measuring polarization itself, was measuring a polarization difference. So this is really the change of paradigm. And after the, the paper in, in, uh, in 92 was, was the idea that this polarization difference uh, can, can, can be in principle computed by, by computing the integral of its derivative. And since the derivative was a, 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 was a first order, what, what was we knew how to, to compute the, the, the derivative. We were trying to do that, but was very difficult because under complete basis and all of a sudden came the, the marvelous uh, paper by David, very elegant and, and, very, and very, uh, very powerful computation. And, and I'm glad that, that you say that you were not happy how the paper has been written because I never confessed it to you before, but I had the same impression. I didn't tell you, but I said with this result, if it's written better, should pass <laughs> very fast. I, I had the same impression that could, given the important result, could have been written better. And I, I'm glad that I never dare to tell this you in order to be uh, in some sense insulting, but I, I, I agree with you. So what happened is I went to the United States in February and there was this, uh, this uh, uh, I presented this, uh, they went back, they met, I came back uh, in the United States in May or, or, or uh, June for the uh, electronic structure workshop. And I checked on, 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 the, on the web that was in North Carolina, Raleigh. And they had a poster. They had a poster, and for the poster, everything became clear what had to be done. So uh, uh, I I don't keep a journal, but I had a logbook of the board. So I checked that I saved only one month so since the, uh, July 7 to uh, or July 8 to August 7. And for sure, about uh, mid August, I was in Lausanne working at the very phase, and we submitted our paper in, in October. Yeah, okay. So this is. All I wanted to say at this point, and then, then uh, we are ready to answer to, to other questions. Thank you, thank you, Raffaele. And uh, you know, I, I have uh, some questions for you, but I would also uh, encourage uh, uh, you know uh, the, the our friends in the audience here to also raise their hands, uh, ask uh, uh, ask questions. I have to confess, uh, um, I've actually seen uh, Richard Martin over there, so it would be wonderful oh. to hear from him, uh, because... Uh, he is uh, online. Uh, I think so. I mean, I, 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 uh, um, I remember, uh, you know, being given uh, the Pika, Cohen and Martin. In fact, he was inspiration at the beginning of my career, yeah. Yeah. My very first, uh, my very first thing, and that was, you know, the I think moment in which uh, either you change field completely or you dive <laughs> very deeply and uh, you understand uh, what is written, uh, uh, what is written in that. Uh, but as I said, people are very welcome uh, to raise their hands 
um, ask, uh, ask uh, questions. But maybe in this theme, I will ask uh, to, to both of you, uh, maybe we invert, I ask first to Rafael and then to David. Uh, uh, you know, if you go back, uh, what have really been, uh, uh, you know, the, the most uh, meaningful uh, experiences for you in terms of, uh, you know, learning uh, that is, uh, it could be, you know, a high school teacher, it could be your university professor, it could be a paper that you have read, it could be something much later. Uh, but, uh, you know, what do you recall as, uh, you know, major uh, experiences uh, in your scientific growth? Well, you, you, you ask it several different questions in a sense, because there are different class uh, of, of answer. As for personal, I know that this is my high school teacher in mathematics. So, so otherwise, um, it, I would not be here today, I would say, because he inspired really a passion for, for beautiful mathematics. He was a very old fashioned man, he did not teach me modern mathematics. And then, what was fascinating was implied, for instance, so 2000 years mathematics, so that or, or things of that kind, not really modern. Also, I wasn't a classical issue. He was a very old guy, he was born in 1899. He was at the war, first war as Ragazzi del 99, you know, something about that. And so he was old fashioned in style. He was on touring, which is also old fashioned, but was really great. And, and all, all of, I learned about how to, to pose myself in front of mathematics, not, 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 not physical at the time. I, I, I owe to him, yeah. Then uh, instead, uh, if you say in the professional career or the moment or the like, is when I arrived in Lausanne. So as I, as I said, um, along the 70s, um, I, I wrote some papers, some, some of them also partly important, but uh, part of the time, thanks to the tenure position, I, I, I was semi-professional sailing. For all of the 70s, my CV, as I said, was for sure more impressive than my CV as a physicist for, uh, until the end of the 70s. And then in November 79, I arrived in Lausanne. I arrived in a building of studio apartments in the other, uh, in the same building that was Stefano Baroni just arrived as me in another studio and Roberto Carr was already living there. In, in, but what is important, uh, in, in, compu modern computational physics was was born exactly in those years, I would say in Berkeley by the end of the 70s, early 80s. And we were immediately just in the middle, and this is thanks to Alfonso Balderetsky. So we were immediately in the middle of this kind of modern physics, it, very few very few labs in the world. By now, there are thousands of people working in so-called total energy methods for, for solids, but instead, by that time, the majority condensed matter physics was of a different kind. So, so the, the, let's say Schrodinger equation for real materials. I would say something which started exactly those years, and I, I was first in, in Lausanne, and, and then in Trieste. I was really in the middle of the action up to the culmination of that with Carparinello uh, uh, doing the very first simulation on 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 the on the terminal nearby hours. I would say in real time. So, oh, yeah. That's uh, that's the moment when I got immersed into the modern theory of materials. Yes. Thanks, uh, thanks, Raffaele. And uh, if we cross the ocean, uh, how was it uh, for you, David? Uh, again, it's uh, a little bit of a difficult um, question to answer because it's so open. I certainly had um, uh, teachers, especially in college, um, who. Um, uh, who very much deepened my interest in physics, mathematics and physics. Um, my uh, thesis advisor, John Joannopoulos, was an enormous influence, as was um, the other advisors, um, Stephen Louie and Marvin Cohen, that I worked with as postdocs, um, that really um, got me interested in the field. Um, uh, you know, I think as I moved along in my, in my research uh, career, um, uh, there were uh, people that I, I didn't know personally so much at that stage, but, uh, you know, I really re <clears throat> uh, respected their work. Actually, Richard Martin, I'll mention right away, is one of them. Uh, Walter Cohn, uh, of course, uh, is another one um, uh, that, uh, that, you know, they wrote uh, really fundamental papers. Um, uh, <clears throat> uh, a, 
another influence I'll mention, um, this is a name that you don't hear very often in this community, is Bert Halperin. So I was at Harvard for some years and uh, had an office, a couple of offices away from Bert, and he was working on you know different kinds of things. But the thing I learned from him, he, he was um, passionate about getting to the bottom of anything. I mean, you would have a discussion at the blackboard, and he did not want to, the discussion to end until he understood the important fundamental point at the at the at the at the bottom of the of the discussion and you know so discussions would sometimes go on for quite a <laughs> quite a long time that way so i i learned that tenaciousness uh, i think uh, uh uh to get to the bottom of things from him and uh and then i learned a tremendous amount and this this goes to nicola from all of the students and postdocs <laughs> who, who worked with me over over the over the years because um, you know, uh, I think uh, all of us, um, you know, appreciate this over time. Um, the discussions that you have, you know, the, the ideas flow both ways. And, um, you know, it's really been uh, a wonderful uh, that part of the reward of the, of the whole uh, career is um, interacting with young people and having them develop and then go out into the world and do wonderful things. And so, uh, <clears throat> but also having learned from them uh, during the time that they were with us. So uh, that's my answer as best I can give it. Thanks, uh, thanks, uh, David. Uh, and uh, um, I relate um, an experience I had, I think uh, one or two years ago, you know, someone, a student, I think of mine, you know, told me, you know, this is a calculation with 300 atoms and, uh, you know, it's very expensive. Uh, and uh, it takes three hours, uh, you know, to accomplish. Uh, so I was shocked. <laughs> you know, I thought it would take, uh, you know, several days on a supercomputer. So can you tell us a little bit how was it uh, to do actually quantum mechanical calculations uh, sort of in the days uh, when you sort of were, you know, developing the theory of polarization or even uh, or even earlier? And I'll ask to David and then to Rafael. Uh, so I'm trying to, I mean, certainly I started out in graduate school uh, carrying boxes of cards to the mainframe computer and you feed them in and, you know, in those days, <clears throat> you had to be very careful to write your program without bugs, <laughs> because I, it would I'm take... I'm sure people would know what is actually, you know, when you say a box of cards. I mean, yeah, I know. Yeah. We should, uh, some sometime we should do a, a demonstration or something like that, but... Um, so I don't know what in, in the 1990s we're talking about. Uh, so we did have our own local computers at that time, but but certainly, um, you know, how should I put it? The um, you know even a relatively small computer is enough to challenge you to figure out how to what is the correct way to calculate something because you can calculate it first on a small unit cell system, and so you know the the fundamental issue of of figuring out the theory of polarization, you know, didn't require large computers, uh, you know, requires a large computer to apply it to a particular system that has a large unit cell. So I, I think, you know, in, in, in my career, I've, I've never really been attracted to the cutting edge problems that require really large computing. I'm more attracted to the interface between the algorithms and the physics where you can do toy model calculations, some, sometimes with tight binding models and not even uh, ab initio. Um, so, um, so for me, the you know total computer power has tended not to be such a such an issue. But uh, you know, uh, I think it was Jim Chalkowski who, who who said, "Is it is it Jim who said that uh, you know the uh, even though the increases in computer power that have occurred over the last decades have been." You know, enormous. Even more important has been our advancement in understanding of uh, you know the correct way to formulate um, uh, the, the physics of, of materials in terms of our ability to compute things. So yeah, I remember him exactly stating you know if I had to choose uh, between uh, the computers of today and the theories of thirty years ago or vice versa, yeah, I would choose the theories of today. And Raffaele, how was it for you? Yeah, of, co of course, uh, we, we were carrying boxes of, uh, of cards, even in Lausanne, uh, not in the same building, so you had to walk with your heavy boxes of cards and then come back the day after to get the output. So you, you, you leave the box uh, with the batch of, of and then, then the computer crunches and then you come back. 
and uh, there was no graphic, of course. The graphic was with the, I don't know, with Rasterelli, so they, you could attach. In the university, I worked a little bit at Purdue, there was a professional drawer. So, so I, I gave a sketch to a professional and a drawing made by a professional. But instead, we had to, to prepare, we had to prepare the drawings in, uh, by ourselves with, with, uh, with those uh, letters which uh, stick, you stick off and, and also the lines and the like. So there was no graphics. The graphic came in with postscript. When I was in Lausanne, at the, uh, the second time I was in Lausanne for a long period of, for the end of the 80s, and I learned to code in postscript. So even by now, all of the pictures you, by me you see, uh, if they are not taken from somebody else's work, if I have done by me, they are done just coding directly in Postscript. So I had the Postscript code written by me. So this is, and for external structure, the, the first principal code were, were I would say, uh, were done at home. They were, they were domaccio, I would say, in PST. No, they were a domaccio thing. That is, everybody has his own version. So I, when I can, uh, we had one in Lausanne, which was, was not really first principal when, when we came back to, to Trieste, there was Stefano as his own and Roberto as his own. And then a student from me, Abdalakte, Ab Ab wrote one from scratch. So every, any, there was not the standard code people, people would use, as instead was already common in, in quantum chemistry. But in our domain, the, the, the code which can be used by uh, the person who has not developed did not exist in the early 80s. We had our one. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'd, I'd like to just. And I think that's a real paradigm change in terms of um, uh, how our community uh, behaves that occurred. I think it was still in the 1990s. It was still the case that, you know, most uh, groups, you know, uh, my group at Rutgers, different groups at different places, everybody had their own first principles code that they had, you know, taken probably from when they were a postdoc or something and then modified it on their own and so on. And um, that's very valuable for learning what's really in the code. Um, you, you know, uh, it's very useful from that point of view. But of course, it's not practical <clears throat> when you uh, start to compete against a code like Abinit or Quantum Espresso that has so many features. I mean, our Rutgers code couldn't do metals, for example. And so that didn't bother me at the time. <laughs> but, you know, so uh, that's a real change in our community that now we use these community codes and uh, and, and maybe there's another paradigm change coming that uh, we, we rely on, uh, you know, uh, the big groups like the um, EPFL group to do all the calculations for us and we just go to databases to get the to get the answers, but uh, uh, hopefully we're not going all the way in that direction. Thanks, uh, thanks David. <laughs> And I think yeah, as, as, as I already said in my talk, in, in the recent years, I, I, we do computational TV on the laptop, not on the supercomputer, and all of them by typically by type binding or, or similar things. And then you can discover new theory of new features, just uh, something you do not expect. There's several computer experiments, you don't, despite the very simplicity of the model, you don't know the answer beforehand. And sometimes the happy, the felicitous times. Uh, uh, so the, 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 what you get is a surprise. You understand something which we have not understood before, even with the time back. And if I can just interject, the perfect example of this is a paper that Raffaella and I and our um, postdocs wrote together. The first paper about orbital magnetization was wrong. And uh, you know we had what we called the local circulation part. So we had the 1A function and we, we computed the circulation in the 1A function. We said, this should be the orbital magnetization. And uh, we wrote this paper, and the the two postdocs were uh, uh, Timo Tonhauser and David Sirisoli were were trying to do type binding calculations to confirm that what Raffaella and I were were convinced had to be right, you know. And they kept coming back and saying it doesn't match, and we'd say there must be a bug, and they'd come back and say no, it doesn't match. And eventually, they convinced us. So that was a, a wonderful experience. Thanks, uh, thanks, David. And uh, I was saying, I uh, say, you know, in the best uh, shows, uh, we have actually a mystery guest uh, that has uh, appeared. I'm really happy to see Richard Martin. I yeah. suppose from Palo Alto, Richard. Where are you joining us uh, from? Uh, you have to unmute. Oh, okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Yes, Palo Alto. It's yeah. Uh, it's really nice to be here, and I really 
didn't want to miss those nice talks by David and Rafaela. So very, very much welcome. And so we drag you in because uh, um, I think besides, you know, being very honored to have you here, I think it would be great uh, to hear also your perspective of, uh, you know, what have been, uh, you know, the educators, uh, the scientists, uh, the works uh, that have really put you in this field of electronic structure theory and calculation, what has really influenced you in the early stages? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> well, uh, let me say first that I really appreciate the nice comments by, by, by uh, Raffaella with my paper and by David too, of course. The, I was really proud of that. And uh, it was a time when when it was kind of fighting against some other people. So it was, uh, you know, it was nice. And uh, uh, so I had zero idea about the, the pretty things with berry faces and all that. But we got to the point where it was clear that there was a current that flowed through the unit cell that had to be taken into account. and. By the 1980s, we had some computers and actually we're doing some calculations on materials and we actually tried to calculate the current, you know, the, the hard way. And so it, it was really nice for uh, Raphael's expressions for, for the current and, and uh, David and King Smith's um, paper that showed that, that uh, you got an answer independent of the, of the path that you chose. And and it is pretty very based stuff. So I had zero idea about that beforehand, and and you really put it together. So back in the day, <laughs> then then uh, you can just imagine what the computer calculations were like in 1974. And uh, this, so I had done calculations on on. Um, with the uh, lattice dynamics, we you know with eight by eight matrices, and on the computer uh, with overnight calculations. But the uh, the the thing that relates to uh, what um, David Vanderbilt was saying was that uh, the person who mentored me most of all was uh, Morrow Cohen, and then also um, uh, Walter Cohen. Uh, so the two uh, were just, you know, just they're just really great people to say the least. And and it was Marco and that pushed me to sort of always look at things from the deepest point of view that I could. That you know, just follow them through. Don't don't give up and and um, think that something is right just because you might be close to the answer or, <laughs> or the your desired answer or something like that. But to look. Why? And so that was the, the business of the polarization. Richard, if, didn't you Richard, didn't you tell me once that Conyers Herring was an influence on you also? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, that was a little later, actually. But, um, but I mean, I should have had this influence from him uh, when it was at Bell Labs, uh, you know, just a little earlier. But somehow I was blind enough not to, not to get the, the, the best influence I could have had from him. But you're 100% right on Conyers and he was even more so in terms of following through and, and really uh, you know, looking for the answers that went down, down deep. Um, Thanks, I have sir. a little story about the polarization that if, if you wouldn't um, please, please. mind me telling. Uh, this was with uh, Mary Duden on the, that related to that paper that Raffaella showed. And, and he was not all that happy about, about saying he was wrong. <laughs> you know, just basically deeply wrong. And uh, I visited him in Irvine where he was at the time. And you, you might know that he is of Russian descent or something I'm not quite sure how Russian he was but 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 definitely it was at least in in his family descent and and I was at the board in his office to explain to him why I thought his calculations were wrong and then suddenly boom right beside me on the blackboard was was this shoe 
that he had thrown across the room and hit the blackboard. <laughs> and uh, and the, 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 this was even more amusing because it was just after the time when Khrushchev threw a shoe at someone <laughs> in the United Nations. <laughs> So it really added to to the the little story that I have about that period of time. So okay. Richard, thanks, uh, thanks, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, um, I have a, a question coming uh, through the 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 the, the chat uh, that says, uh, "Thank you for the great talks." Uh, though developing new theories takes time, and unfortunately, the the pace, uh, pressure, and rush of research nowadays. Uh, makes it difficult to dedicate time to fundamental problems. Uh, what could you advise to younger researchers on this matter? And maybe we'll get David Raffaele and I'll ask Richard as well, if you feel ready to give advice to the junior uh, scientist that you know, in 30 years they'll say, I follow that advice or I didn't follow that advice and that was very important. Uh, I, yeah, it's, <clears throat> it's true. Uh, it's very hard to keep up with things nowadays. It was much easier in, in, in earlier in my career to, you know, I, I would read, I would, I would leaf through every, every uh, issue of phys physical review letters, the paper copy, I would leaf through to look for interesting yeah. papers, you know, and it's been a very long time. And then there was a while when I used to kind of try to catch all of, you know, browse through all of the archive cond mat titles. And I don't even do that anymore, you know, so, but I, I guess my answer would be just set aside, you should set aside some time, you find some way, maybe, you know, Friday afternoons or whatever works for you, set aside a time where you put all that other stuff away and pull out the projects that you're interested in working on and, you know, turn off the phone and, <laughs> and, uh, and spend some concentrated time. Uh, that would be my my recommendation. Thanks, David. And uh, Raffaele, what would you well, say? Uh, say um, by now, the computational physics is done by very, very large groups. So, so like, like those critics and many others in the world. And so it's clear that the young people, in, in some sense, have, have a short uh, a near aim, that is to do they don't have time you know my kind of physics by now so particularly something uh, i have at most one students and i try to figure out new things and instead instead uh, if if uh, a young people has to start a career in in uh, in the computational physics and so instructor, i would not recommend to 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 try uh, to have a career in, you know, in this style that is type binding and the like uh, unless you go into uh, topological insulator, something very, very, very uh, in, in fashionable or the like. And so uh, instead, the, the few students that I had, all of them uh, after uh, entered into, into ab initio first principle and, and uh, quantum espresso calculation or typically or things like that, I, I, I would say. Thanks, Rafael. And uh, Richard, we'll ask you also the question. So what kind of advice uh, would you give uh, to new researchers in the field? Uh, if any, of course, uh, but... Uh... Oh, okay. <laughs> wow. Well, the main thing would be to, to look deeply <laughs> at, at any, any problem that you're working on. Um, and, and with, with regard to keeping up the literature, wow. Um, somehow I can imagine that if I were way younger, I might be able to figure out ways to sort through the literature and, you know, and pull out the things that are most interesting since there are all these ways to sort things. Um, I like, so 20 years ago, I, I was so proud to make um, a list of, of uh, other electronic structure groups and, and things, things like that and where, where are their websites and try to make this available online that other people could find. And um, uh, then that's just useless now. You can get that way quicker just by typing in a name or two and you know anything online. So, so it would be 
uh, I, have, I have the hopes that that we'll be able to come back to uh, more uh, easy ways to find things in, in your own field, things that you sort of already know about, and then pay more attention to the things like David uh, just said, you know, really trying to look for new things. And, um, and hope you see what I mean. And not just get overwhelmed by this huge amount of data, but uh, organize it in good ways and still be looking for new stuff. Um, uh, and, and using computers in good ways, like, like using the databases, which, which I just don't do at all, but, but can imagine that there could be you know, really good ways to use these things. Thanks, uh, thanks, Richard. I can't resist actually offering my own advice uh, because uh, you know, hearing actually David yeah. mention uh, you know the work uh, that he and Rafael and Timo and David did, uh, um, you know, uh, I, I realized and I learned that actually you know when things don't work uh, is actually the time when you learn yeah. something and you should really be happy when something doesn't work and something doesn't yeah. make sense <laughs> because uh, you know this is the time. Uh, when you when you make progress, I think we are getting uh, close to the end. I think also I don't want to keep uh, everyone uh, beyond uh, what is six here. So I have uh, a mystery question uh, for uh, our two speakers, uh, for David uh, and uh, Raffaele, uh, and that comes uh, from uh, the BBC. I don't know how much of you are familiar with the, the Desert Island books, uh, but basically uh, there is the question: uh, you have to be stranded. Uh, on a desert island. And so the only thing that you can do is bring with you one book, one piece of music, and one luxury item. And so the question for David and Raffaele is what book, what music, and what luxury item will you bring? And I don't know who of the two of you is uh, ready first uh, to answer this question. Uh. Well, okay. yeah, I, I'll, I'll let Raffaele go. Yeah, I'm ready because the, the broadcast exists in Italy uh, every Sunday morning, and uh, also the lady who the host of this uh, of this radio talk is uh, has a PhD in mathematics, so is uh, Chiara Valerio, and uh, so I made the exercise in advance. <laughs> So suppose she invites me, what I would like to tell. And for the book, for the book, no doubt, I have the Histoire de ma vie the, of the great Giacomo Casanova, for sure. He, of course, in the French edition, La Pleiade. But at the second place, I would put Orlando Furioso, Ariosto. And for the music, if opera is allowed, is La Traviata, of course. And then the movie is more difficult. Many, many movies, historical, uh, dramatic. Uh, let's say, let's say Fellini, Vitelloni, for instance, or something like that. Thanks. It's a, <laughs> I love them. Very Italian, I think. As a <laughs> set of so I'll pass the question to David uh, then. Uh, David, uh, what do uh, what well. you do? I'm, I'm unprepared for this, so I'll give uh, frivolous answers, I guess. Uh, uh, for the book, maybe War and Peace, since <laughs> it's really long, and then I don't have to read, <laughs> read it so frequently. <laughs> and um, as an always, 3,000 pages, uh, including <laughs> notes. <laughs> and then what the second one is uh, music. Um, uh, I don't know. Uh, um, um, some um, some jazz anthology or something like that. And the a third one is what? Well, it was a luxury item. Actually. Luxury <laughs> item. Yeah, it became a movie, but uh, you can choose. Uh... Well, I don't know. I I guess I I have this I have this watch, and I, I love this watch. I I I actually got an Apple Watch a few years ago, and then I just. I stopped wearing it after a while and I went back to this watch. I don't know if you call this a luxury item. It's not, but it's, you know, it's actually mechanical, electromechanical. Um, there's some, there's some semiconductor electronics in there. It's got a little photovoltaic sensor so that it never has to be wound or, or shaken or anything like that. And it just goes forever. And I love it. 
So I would, I would want to have that with me on the, on, on the island. It's a reminder of what technology can do. Thank you, David. We are live from Switzerland, of course, so I can't <laughs> see any better a sort of fitting conclusion. <laughs> So, I'm sorry, it's a Japanese watch. But anyway. <laughs> so, so with this, uh, I really want uh, to thank uh, David and Rachele both for the beautiful talks and uh, for being a uh, game in sort of uh, this uh, live session at the end. Uh, thanks, Richard, uh, for graciously being our, uh, you know, mystery guest. Thank you for letting me be there. Thanks for I've been Beverly passing behind, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's correct. as well. <laughs> and I've and she wasn't here to see uh, Bettina's picture, which was yeah, wonderful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, uh, Ignacio and Sara from uh, SECAM uh, and uh, Patrick that coordinates all of this. Uh, nothing of this will be lost. Uh, it will be recorded and available uh, together with <laughs> all the databases uh, on okay. the SECAM and the Marvel uh, website. Uh, um, so with this, uh, I thank you again, uh, all of you and all our audience uh, sort of uh, near and far.